Hello and good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Vinicius Mariano de Carvalho. I am Vice Dean International here at uh, the Faculty of Social Science and Public Policy at King's College London. It's a great honor and pleasure for us to introduce and to start this event here today, this discussion about Korean Peninsula Peace Forum. And it's a great honor for us as well to host uh, the presence of the Mr. Ambassador from the Republic of Korea here with us to this opening uh, remarks as well. Um, at King's College London, our vision for the future is to make the world a better place through our teaching and research. And with the excellence of this teaching and research, also influentiate and change and serve our society. I think this event, it's a good example of that. In our Faculty of Social Science and Public Policy, we have several scholars and students um, promoting research, dialogue, discussions, and teaching in promotion of peace and in dialogue with Korea, what is also a very uh, important aspect for, for us here at King's. Uh, our colleague, uh, Dr. Ramon, who is not here with us at this moment, I think online with us uh, uh, today, um, is, a, is one of those um, strong guiding people that helps us to keep this scholarship in a high level. So we are very proud and very honored to have you all together with us here in such a special moment for the world and such a special moment for the Korean Peninsula in particular. Just before we started here, we were chatting and saying that, yes, we, we are seeing probably with hope uh, some progresses in democracies around the world, even with all the challenge that we are facing. And we, we are seeing as well as a, a good momentum to promote this discussion, to promote this conversation, and make transformation in this world that we are facing and working with. It's our task as a university to really look at the future, to prepare the present, to transform this present, and look for a better future. So I truly believe that what we are having here today, what we'll be discussing here today and listening here, will come with quite important outcomes for looking at this future and make this transformation of this future. As I said, King's College London is very proud of having you here, Mr. Ambassador in particular, to have your presence here with us. It's a great honor. Um, and I will actually pass the word to you now, so you can also make your initial remarks. And thank you very much, all of you that join us here today for this event. Thank you very much. Okay, this may be a little too much, you know, a sub substantive opening remarks, but uh, Dr. Vinicius Carvalho, distinguished professors and researchers, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the Korean Peninsula Peace Forum, an annual event hosted by the Korean Embassy in collaboration with prestigious institutions in the United Kingdom, such as King's College London. I would like to begin my remarks by thanking all of our distinguished speakers for being so kind as to offer their valuable time and expertise to participate in today's forum. The Korean Peninsula Peace Forum has been a valuable pl platform through which eminent scholars and uh, expert practitioners in the field of inter-Korean relations gather, discuss, and come up with valuable ideas to achieve greater peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula in this regard, I would like to convey my sincere gratitude to King's College London for jointly organizing this year's forum with my embassy. This year's forum is particularly meaningful for several reasons. Um, firstly, we are living in a world where geopolitical tensions are rising and uncertainties in global politics are becoming a normalcy. Among other issues, the missile and nuclear programs of North Korea continue to expand and pose grave threats to international peace and stability. North Korea is on the verge of what would be its seventh nuclear test and has repeatedly and brazenly violated multiple UN Security Council resolutions. In a worrying sign of, uh, of the mounting threats posed by North Korea, it enacted a law, new law in September on its nuclear policy, stipul stipulating the use of nuclear weapons not only for deterrence purposes, but also as war fighting capabilities, heightening the possibility of a preemptive nuclear strike. 
In addition to ranging on uh, its promise to keep the moratorium on nuclear and long-range missile tests, North Korea is further developing tactical nuclear weapons capabilities, uh, specifically targeting the Republic of Korea. North Korea has launched a record number of missiles this year, and its belligerence is only growing. This year alone, North Korea has launched a total of 61 ballistic missiles on 29 occasions, and six cruise missiles on three occasions. Earlier this month, in a distressing escalation, North Korea launched around 25 projectors in a single day, which included a barrage of artillery fire into waters of South Korea's coast. One ballistic missile even crossed the northern limit line, a maritime border separating uh, the two parties, which is an unacceptable infringement of Republic Korea's sovereign territory. This is the first time that a North Korean ballistic missile has landed south of the limit since the Korean War ended. This act demonstrates an alarming intensification in North Korea's hostile behavior. Potential risks to human life and safety are quite worrisome, as one missile landed less than six, 60 kilometers from the city of Sokcho in the northeast of South Korea. The residents of, uh, of the island of Ullungdo in the East Sea were also forced to evacuate to shelters for their own protection. Second, as all of you are well aware, we have a new administration in the Republic of Korea this year. The Yoon Suk Nyeol administration, my namesake, uh, has been resolute uh, in countering the provocations of North Korea by firmly maintaining the defense posture of the ROK-US alliance. We also came up with our own sanctions regime for the first time in the last five years uh, on the individuals and entities that are believed to have been funding the unlawful nuclear and ballistic missile programs of North Korea. By doing so, we aim to deter North Korea from engaging in further nuclear development by depriving the regime of its various sources of illicit revenue, cutting off funds, derived from cryptocurrency heists and overseas workers. However, it does not mean that we have let up on our diplomatic efforts to attain the denuclearization of North Korea. In fact, we have been persuading North Korea to come to the negotiating table to engage in meaningful dialogue. As a case in point, our policy termed the audacious initiative for denuclearized, peaceful, and prosperous Korean Peninsula aims to achieve sustainable peace, security, and prosperity on the Korean Peninsula by realizing the complete denuclearization of North Korea through principled and consistent negotiations. It also proposes audacious plans, such as the Resources Food Exchange Program, and plans to modernize hospitals and public health infrastructure in North Korea. This generous package is aimed at securing the peaceful denuclearization of North Korea and ensuring a prosperous and healthy life for all its inhabitants. The new administration also appointed an ambassador for international cooperation on North Korean human rights to address the dire human rights situation in the North. All these indicate a revamped approach of the Yoon administration toward the North. My colleague from the embassy will explain the audacious initiative of my government in greater detail in later session. Last but not least, we are living in a time when the cooperation and coalition of friends and allies who share common values and commitment to the rules-based international order, non-proliferation, and human rights are becoming more and more important. The United Kingdom has been a most reliable partner across the board in this regard. We have been working closely together in our efforts to realize a peaceful and stable Korean Peninsula. We appreciate that the UK government expressed its support for the audacious initiative uh, back in September when Foreign Secretary uh, James Cleverly met with Foreign Minister Park Jin uh, in Seoul. 
During their dialogue, the two sides further reiterated their opposition to any provocations from North Korea, including launches that used ballistic missile technology and committed to strengthen uh, cooperation aimed at tackling illicit cyber activities and ensuring the full implementation of sanctions on North Korea. We also take note that uh, in tandem with the United States, the United Kingdom, a permanent member of the UN Security Council, has led a new sanctions regime against North Korea, urging it to stop its illicit weapons programs. In addition, the UK government has come out with statements condemning North Korea's uh, ballistic missile tests and reaffirming UK's commitment to sanctions targeting North Korea's weapons programs. At the same time, the UK has been urging North Korea to return to dialogue and pr prioritize the well-being of its people. I would like to wrap up my remarks by thanking all of you once again for kindly participating in today's forum. While the Republic of Korea may be the main stakeholder in this ordeal, we ask once again for the continued interest and support of the UK and other like-minded nations as we together strive to deal with North Korea's aggressive actions. In this context, forums such as today's, which bring together scholars and practitioners from different countries and specialties are of key importance as we collectively cope with North Korea's dangerous provocations, reaffirm our mutual commitment to denuclearization of North Korea, and eventually realizing peace on the Korean Peninsula. Thank you very much for your attention. So, um, I'm not the master of ceremonies here, but I just want to thank you again. Thanks, Ambassador, for your words. Uh, and I think we, without much ado, invite the first panel to join the table, and especially the moderator, Dr. Tatian Kong, that will uh, chair this, this first discussion here. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Ready to start? Um, are, the, are we re ready to start? Are the mics the mics on? Okay, thank you. Um, well, thanks to uh, thanks to King's King's College and the Embassy of the Republic of Korea for hosting this event. Uh, I'm Tachan Kong from SOAS, and I'm the chair of this uh, I'm the chair of this panel. Um, so, following on from the the speech by the by the ambassador to set the context we have a since I was here this time this time last year we have a, a new South Korean administration uh, and since then there have uh, there have been many many changes in the strategic situation on the Korean Peninsula uh, North Korea proclaimed a new nuclear doctrine uh, it staged many more uh, tests of its uh, missiles uh, many more tests, many more types of many more types of missiles. So, whether these uh, tests succeed or, or not, they still gain intelligence from these from these tests. They still gain information, so the program continues to advance. And these tests have been met with very firm United States South Korean demonstrations of military capability. Uh, and this is set against the context of deteriorating United States China relations. Uh, deteriorating Western-Russian relations over the war in Ukraine. Um, on the 15th of August, in his uh, uh, 
uh, Independence Day address, President uh, Yoon suk yeol announced a, an audacious initiative whereby uh, South Korea would assist the North to modernize its economy and society in return for denuclearization. De um, so today we will talk, on this panel, we will talk more about the audacious initiative and also the potential for the European Union and the United Kingdom to uh, facilitate the process. Um, the panelists, I have a distinguished, uh, we have a distinguished panel here and on my on my left is uh, Dr. Reinhold Brender, who is a former uh, official of the European Union. Uh, for five years, he, was the, uh, he led the European External Action Service team in charge of EU relations with North and South Korea. And um, on, my, on my right is um, uh, Sophie, Sophie, Sophie Larder from, from NATO, uh, who's worked in NATO's political affairs and security policy division since 2011. And uh, on my far, on my far, on my far right is, um, is uh, Mr. Hyung Chol Park, the political counselor of the, of the Embassy of the Republic of Korea in the United, United Kingdom. So we have a, we have a distinguished, uh, distinguished and knowledgeable panel here. Uh, each of the panelists will talk for about 10 to, 10 to 15 minutes, and this will be followed by questions and answers. So maybe to, uh, the, the place to start will be with uh, uh, political councillor Park to talk about the audacious initiative of the uh, South, Korea, South Korean government and uh, you know, how this differs from previous uh, initiatives of engagement with North Korea. So the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for coming to uh, today's event. I'm um, really glad to see all of you. Um, before I start my remarks, maybe I should just go into uh, my background a little bit more. I was involved in the six-party talks up leading up to the September 19th agreement, and I also served as an advisor to my foreign minister and an assistant secretary to my president, and I was a director of North Korean Affairs back in Capitol so that's my background. So I've been working on issues uh, involving North Korea for quite some time. And uh, I can't disclose all uh, confidential information, but uh, today I'm a panelist uh, talking about um, an initiative which is uh, open out there. So I'll go into a little bit of detail of uh, what this initiative is. And maybe during the Q&A session, um, if somebody asks, I'll talk about how it, would, it might differ from other um, initiatives or negotiations we had in the past. So um, during the Liberation Day address made by President Yoon back in uh, the 15th of August, um, he emphasized that denuclearization of North Korea is essential for sustainable peace on the Korean Peninsula in Northeast Asia and indeed around the world. Um, with that in mind, uh, the full name of this policy is the Audacious Initiative for Denuclearized, Peaceful, and Prosperous Korean Peninsula. Its main objective is to carry out principled and consistent negotiations on denuclearization. And in turn, it would establish sustainable peace, security, and prosperity on the Korean Peninsula through the complete denuclearization of North Korea. The Republic of Korea would like to play a central role as we are a direct and key stakeholder in this area. And we will pursue um, this initiative under close coordination with our ally, the United States, and in close cooperation with the UK and the rest of the international community. The format would be a comprehensive agreement followed by phased implementation we would like to reach a very bold, balanced, and comprehensive agreement which includes North Korea's denuclearization measures and corresponding measures by the other party. Implementation would be phased with safety measures in place so that we could guard against North Korea's noncompliance. The key features of this initiative are 
set out in three main phases. The first is a pre-negotiation phase, the second is a negotiation phase, and the last will be a implementation phase. The first pre-negotiation phase, we want to create a strategic environment that will leave North Korea no choice but to return to denuclearization talks. So to this end, the uh, Republic of Korea will take a holistic approach that deters North Korea's nuclear threats, dissuades North Korea's nuclear development, and pursues dialogue and diplomacy. The second negotiation phase, we will work towards a comprehensive agreement on the overall roadmap of the denuclearization process. So we will not pursue partial or phased agreements, but we will first try to agree on the entire denuclearization process and implement the agreement in a phased manner. So once North Korea returns to the negotiations table with sincerity, Republic of Korea is ready to take an initial set of actions right at the start of the negotiation. Uh, some of the examples uh, I can cite are, as the ambassador mentioned, we have a program called the Resources Food Exchange Program, where we would permit the limited ex export of North Korea's sanctioned mineral resources by utilizing the sanctions exemptions uh, we can uh, put into effect and allow North Korea to use the generated revenue to procure necessities such as food, fertilizers, and medicine. Other pilot projects to improve North Korea people's livelihood in the areas of public health, so we we'll modernize hospitals, agriculture, so we could provide technical assistance to enhance agricultural activity and improve drinking water and other uh, such projects. And they could be further expanded in tandem with progress made in the denuclearization of North Korea. The third uh, implementation phase, Korea, Republic of Korea is ready to provide a set of uh, corresponding measures that encompass not only economic measures, but political and military aspects as well. Once North Korea embarks on the path of substantive denuclearization, uh, some of the examples that we have in mind are to provide assistance for North Korea's power generation, transmission and distribution infrastructure, modernize their ports and airports for international trade, modernize their medical infrastructure and hospitals, provide assistance for agricultural technology, and provide assistance for international investments and finance. And a political and military corresponding measure would be providing diplomatic assistance for normalizing their relations with the United States, and also starting discussions on uh, disarmament of conventional weapons. Uh, there's a condition to all that we have to offer. We are going to maintain North Korean sanctions regime until the complete denuclearization of North Korea, while utilizing, as I mentioned earlier, par partial sanctions exemptions uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. So I'd like to end uh, my intervention by citing uh, President Yoon once again uh, on the remarks he made at, at his inaugural address. He emphasized that the door to dialogue will remain open so that we can peacefully resolve this threat. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Councillor Park. Um, now I would like to move on to um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Brenda. Yeah. Yeah, good morning. Many thanks, um, and in particular, many thanks to the co organizers of the event, uh, to the mission of the Republic of Korea and King's College. Uh, and many thanks also, of course, to my co panelists and all the uh, people who follow this discussion. Now, um, my name is Reinhold Brenda. I've been heading the team in Brussels for five years until this summer um, that followed and was in charge of um, helping steer uh, relations with North and South Korea. And from that perspective, I want a little bit to explain where we stand um, from the European Union perspective in our relations with the Korean Peninsula, focusing on the DPRK nuclear issue. Um, I, I believe very important uh, comments have already been provided by Ambassador Yoon in particular, and also Councillor Park. They have made clear that the situation changes. The situation has changed and is, con is continuing to change, and I see essentially four, uh, four perhaps even five uh, elements uh, which uh, more recently have been um, changing the picture. 
The first um, is, of course, uh, um, of course, we see this intensified and diversified um, effort of DPRK to uh, develop its weapons program, and that will be a dedicated discussion, so I will not focus on this. But let me say that, um, essentially, I want to present um, the three main elements I see of change, and then say where we stand from the EU side and in a conclusion draw a, a sketch out how we can uh, nevertheless, despite this changing environment, try to maintain and, uh, and develop our uh, approach which continues to focus on denuclearization. So the changing context. We have indeed seen that DPRK has moved from the possible bargaining of some of its nuclear programs in return for diplomatic normalization and the lifting of sanctions, which seemed the possibility until the February 2019 Hanoi summit between President Trump and leader Kim Jong-un. It has moved to an insistence that it will never bargain anymore. And reference was already made uh, this morning to the speech that uh, Kim Jong-un gave um, uh, in September, where he announced, indeed, uh, a change of the nuclear doctrine, implying, indeed, that ultimately it is not to be excluded that DPRK would use um, nuclear weapons uh, also to, um, to, um, to, not only to deter, but also to preempt uh, an attack. So, in response to this um, uh, changing um, uh, approach of DPRK and the intensification of its efforts to diversify and develop its program further, President Moon has been very strongly focusing on deterrence uh, more recently, and in this he has um, uh, quite naturally worked closely and continues to work closely with the main ally, the United States, and we have seen large-scale exercises ongoing in the summer and after the summer until last month, involving notably uh, joint exercises of uh, air forces and also following on to um, uh, forces uh, exercises at sea. So we have this change um, uh, of, of the approach of DPRK and in reaction also of the Republic of Korea, which has had to adapt. Um, the second uh, element, which I believe is indeed new, and now I'm turning to the EU more specifically, we as the EU have uh, launched, launched last year uh, an Indo-Pacific strategy. And that's quite important. And last year I had already the privilege um, to participate in this uh, uh, Korea Peace, uh, uh, Peninsula Peace Forum. I explained what this strategy is about. In a nutshell, it is indeed about uh, joining efforts with others, notably in the region, and South Korea is a key partner there, because the strategy is strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. It's an effort to join forces with those in the region, notably South Korea and others from outside the region also, that are willing to promote the rule of law and to uphold the rule um, of law. And the importance of this has been stressed by Ambassador Yoon rightly. So we have an interest in getting engaged as the EU in working with others, notably the Republic of Korea, in upholding peace and security uh, in this vast space, which is terribly ambitious, I admit this, but we have an ambition also, and we have, of course, to work with others. Um, and uh, this ambition also um, is targeting uh, the Korean Peninsula situation, where we indeed, uh, like many others, believe there must be a change to the better. So we want to be uh, a player also when it comes to promoting peace on the Korean Peninsula. Um, I will explain a little bit later what we have in mind. We are not directly the main players. We are not in the driver's seat. I think that's obvious. We are not claiming this. But I want to make very clear the European Union stands ready uh, to come in uh, to support any meaningful diplomatic process. And for the European Union, there can only be a diplomatic solution. Second point, therefore, the Indo-Pacific strategy, our willingness to step up efforts in support of peace and security in the region, notably in, uh, on the Korean Peninsula also. Now, the third important element also is indeed the fallout um, of the invasion by Russia of Ukraine. And I would say... Um, it has accelerated and development which was already uh, tangible, I would argue. But we have seen indeed um, now uh, the Security Council of the United Nations no longer being in a position 
to impose new sanctions on DPRK because there is not the necessary unity anymore in the Security Council. And in March, as already in as, as then also in October, uh, there was no um, not the necessary consensus in the Security Council for additional sanctions in reaction to the latest uh, weapons developments by DPRK. So these are three elements. Um, the fourth element, the three elements indeed being the change of the DPRK's, um, uh, I would say the further intensification of its uh, militarization efforts and its nuclear doctrine, which is now new and includes also preemptive strikes possibly. Second, the Indo-Pacific strategy. Third element indeed, um, the cooperation between Russia and China and uh, both being less constructive on DPRK metals as seen from the perspective. Now, um, it is very important now to note that the European Union absolutely uh, maintains uh, its ambition to promote non-proliferation. So there is no debate. Uh, at, uh, there is no debate about a possible discarding of this very important objective. Quite to the contrary, the intention is to continue uh, to try to promote non-proliferation, and um, in particular also. Uh, the um, Comprehensive uh, Testament uh, Treaty. Um, and so there is no discussion um, in the European Union about uh, possibly moving to discussions about uh, on arms control with DPRK. Uh, as I said, the intention is to maintain the existing approach, and it was just set out all the 27 member states together through High Representative uh, Borrell, the High Representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, on the, uh, I think it was on the 4th of November, issued a, a joint statement where they uh, underscored the existing position, which uh, indeed says, unsurprisingly, that we insist that DPRK must immediately comply with all United Nations Security Council resolutions by abandoning all its nuclear weapons, other weapons of mass destruction, ballistic missile programs, and existing nuclear programs in a complete, verifiable, and irreversible manner, and cease all related activities. Then we also insist that illegal actions by, taken by the DPRK cannot and will never confer upon it the status of a, non, of a nuclear weapon state in accordance with the non-proliferation treaty or any special status in this regard. And we call on DPRK to return immediately to full compliance with the non-proliferation treaty. And we uh, um, also, another element, insist on the unity of the international community. So we do want um, uh, a unity of the, of the approaches of all the like-minded in implementing notably sanctions targeting DPRK because we have to uphold the pressure on DPRK so that a negotiated process becomes possible. Then we uh, express also our uh, full solidarity with the Republic of Korea and also Japan in the current situation and call on DPRK to engage in dialogue with all relevant parties. As I said, from the EU perspective, there is certainly not uh, any other possibility than a negotiated solution. And uh, we want, therefore, a diplomatic process and stand ready to be helpful um, uh, in this respect, as I already said. Now, in a nutshell, we have a policy uh, that we have been calling and continue to call a policy of critical engagement. So we, we want to engage with DPRK to the extent possible. Currently, there is not much, uh, there is basically uh, not much happening in terms of engagement. Uh, the focus is very much on the critical side, on the implementation of, of um, sanctions. All this said, I think we have to acknowledge the situation is sobering. We have been trying for many years to make non-proliferation work and to uh, come to a situation where DPRK renounces on its nuclear weapons. We have to, we have to acknowledge we are not there. So we, what is the conclusion we want to draw from this? And this is now my, my final, my, these are now my final words. Um, the conclusion we draw from this is that um, Rather than uh, discarding our approach, we should try again to make it work. And I come back to what Councillor Park said and also to the importance of um, the audacious uh, initiative of President Yoon, which already uh, Ambassador Yoon, the namesake Ambassador, um, uh, stressed rightly. I think personally, um, uh, and not only personally, because uh, it is indeed your policy also, um, indeed, we, we want to uphold the principle of non-proliferation, and that has been confirmed, by the way, not just by the member states, but also by the G7 foreign ministers in their recent statement. Uh, um, so uh, we, there's a full um, uh, commonality of views. 
And um, the purpose, now the intention is we have to make this work, as I said, our approach. And um, I personally believe, uh, this, this are now my, is, is now rather my personal interpretation of the situation, we have to try from the EU side to work very closely with the Republic of Korea in taking the audacious, audacious initiative forward. I think there is a very interesting uh, proposal on the table. We are well aware, of course, that DPRK in its first reaction has rejected this. Um, the question I have personally, is it conceivable that, um, you know, there have been efforts already earlier and we could build on this, that um, we try to make a proposal which uh, for now uh, does not uh, couple it with denuclearization efforts, you know, not, at least not on paper, so that we have a constructive engagement with DPRK on, um, on issues of um, improving the uh, internal situation in the country, because the situation is dire. We have not yet, it has not yet been mentioned, but the situation is dire. The uh, World Food Programme estimates that in the years 2019, 20, and 21, uh, more than 40% of the population uh, more recently have been undernourished. And the figure was first out in 2019. I've, I've noted in preparing for this event today that uh, the World Food Programme uh, has uh, provided an update, and I see now that for all three years, the, on, on average, more than 40% of the population are undernourished, uh, and um, uh, the, the situation is simply dire. I don't want to go into enough, any further detail, but I believe the situation is such that, uh, in principle, uh, there is strong reasons for DPRK to try to seek and to accept support from the outside, which could, of course, also include um, uh, assistance on the health side, uh, notably on COVID, which of course still is an issue, even though DPRK has declared the problem is over, but of course COVID is still a challenge for all of us. So in conclusion, um, um, I believe that um, it is worth exploring whether a new ambitious international offer of both COVID vaccines and food aid, as well as related assistance, could be offered building uh, on the audacious initiative of President Yoon, which would pool efforts of different pro uh, donors and provide for new engagement with DPRK so as to create a possible new opening for diplomacy in a second step. Um, and I believe we are, have probably a better chances of success if such an offer were to be framed in an international context without preconditions for political action by Pyongyang, um, and I do not, I, I have no illusion whatsoever that it will be very difficult uh, to get this accepted by DPRK. I mean, we have seen a lot of reluctance over the years. Um, but still, I believe it's worthwhile trying. It's very interesting that the Republic of Korea, which from our perspective has indeed a lead role in finding a solution to the problem, and we are, I believe, can uh, build on this and uh, try to um, see how best uh, to. Um, make it work. Uh, I, I say it's very difficult, but I do not see any other option with higher chances uh, of success for now. And if successful, it could open an avenue for dialogue with Pyongyang that would include the US and the Republic of Korea as the major donors. And while South Korea's policy of deterrence would probably have to continue, such an approach would provide a credible offer of strongly positive engagement in parallel and joint EU Republic of Korea work in the preparation of such an assistance package would be fully consistent with the EU Republic of Korea cooperation in the implementation of the EU's Indo-Pacific strategy, on which I could elaborate further separately. And at the same time, I believe China would find it difficult to find reasons to reject an initiative based on humanitarian assistance and aimed at resuming dialogue. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Brenda. Uh, thanks very much, Dr. Brenda. And now to uh, Sophie Larder from NATO. Thank Please. you very much. Thank you. And um, let me begin by thanking uh, the organizers and the fellow panel members. It's a real uh, honor as well to be here at Racket Kings. I, I studied here in the War Studies Department uh, back in 2010, uh, so it's the first time I've been back. So it's an honor to be here and uh, to be discussing this uh, very interesting topic. A little note on my side, I've, uh, I'm a quite a, a newcomer to the file. I've been working on NATO's relations with the Republic of Korea for the last two years. Prior to that, uh, working uh, for a decade or so on NATO's relations with Russia, um, a different but related, very related topic in many ways. So um, I'm going to go uh, over uh, some of the points from, from the NATO perspective uh, today. 
And I would say, as, a, as desk officer for uh, NATO's relations with the Republic of Korea, today's topic of the UN administration's approach to North Korea and NATO's, in, in correspondence with NATO's relations with the Republic of Korea, is, is a really interesting question to address because, in many ways, it really goes to the heart of what NATO does with our partnership relations. So we are, uh, as NATO, promoting peace and what we call projecting stability through the third pillar of, the, of our core tasks, which is cooperative security. And this uh, core task was, again, reiterated in NATO's um, new strategic concept, which, uh, of course, you'll see unveiled at the NATO summit in Madrid in July. So we have, uh, alongside the Republic of Korea, a wide network of partners with whom we work together really on a daily basis towards this goal. And of course, uh, the, the new strategic concept has, has come against the backdrop of the current security environment in the Euro-Atlantic, which of course has deteriorated so dramatically uh, in recent months due to Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. But very interestingly and relevant for our discussion today, uh, NATO's new strategic concept, concept makes clear you know, for the first time that the Indo-Pacific region is important for NATO, particularly given that developments in that region can directly affect Euro-Atlantic security. In the new strategic context, we also, as allies, pledge to strengthen dialogue and cooperation with both new and existing partners in the Indo-Pacific to tackle cross-regional challenges and shared security interests. So against this backdrop, um, I would say that NATO's relations with the Republic of Korea are, are, and with the broader Indo-Pacific region are not new. Um, NATO and the Republic of Korea have been long-standing partners with a, a, a history of supporting each other in our common security concerns. Uh, first cooperation dates back to 2006, and we've been working on what we call an individual partnership and cooperation program since 2012. And for our part, on, on North Korea and all the issues uh, there, we've, for NATO, has made, long made clear our commitment to supporting the Republic of Korea's goal of the complete and irreversible denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. We've done this at the highest level politically. We've reiterated in summit communiques and have even issued standalone statements by the North, North Atlantic Council, notably condemning North Korea's last nuclear test back in 2017. And the Republic of Korea has also in turn been an important security partner for, for NATO in uh, supporting us on important challenges. Republic of Korea was part of our ISAF and Resolute Support missions in Afghanistan and a contributor to the Afghan National Army Trust Fund. And, We've worked together in the past on counter-piracy, counter-terrorism, and today topics like cyber defense, technology, and arms control are, are really important for our, for our shared agenda. But likewise, on, on Euro-Atlantic security developments, um, it was very important that in April 2022, uh, the former Republic of Korea Foreign Minister, Chung Yi Yong, participated in NATO's foreign minister's meeting uh, at a critical juncture for Europe, of course. This was in the immediate aftermath of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And then, of course, President Yoon made history in July by being the first uh, Republic of Korea president to attend a NATO summit. And he did so alongside the other leaders of NATO's <coughs> Asia-Pacific partners. So they are Australia, Japan, and New Zealand. Um, and in recent months, and, and looking at this from, from our staff officer perspective, it's really clear that our partnership is stepping up. And, and I think this is in many ways this response to the severe security environment we are both facing in our respective regions, and the increasing links we see with security uh, in our regions. On DPRK, clearly, the, the situation is, is, is very worrying. Um, NATO is deeply concerned by the persistent, provocative, and dangerous behavior, including the missile tests. As I've mentioned, we've stated our full support to the goal of complete, verifiable, and irreversible denuclearization in the, of the Korean Peninsula in accordance with the relevant Security Council resolutions. And we do believe that like-minded countries across the globe must continue walking, working together towards this vital aim. Because DPRK's actions are, they deeply destabilizing for regional security in the Indo-Pacific, but, but they do also critically undermine global security. They undermine international law and the rules-based international order. And of course, this is very important for NATO, as we've stated time and time again. On President Yoon's audition initiative, and thanks, many thanks to Councillor Park for the really interesting um, summary of, uh, of everything you're doing. I think it's, it's really interesting from NATO's perspective that the Republic of Korea's um, approach makes clear the necessity of strong deterrence, but also the need for long-standing alliances. Because I think at the moment we can't avoid the reality that strong, credible deterrence against any nuclear threat is a real precondition for regional stability in Asia, just as it is in Europe today, but also for the ultimate denuclearization of North Korea. 
I did say, yeah. And NATO also particularly values President Yoon's approach to multilateralism and his commitment to upholding the rules-based international order that he expressed in his recent speech to the UN General Assembly. Because this, this focus on multilateralism mirrors NATO's own approach to working with our like-minded Asia-Pacific partners. This, uh, this is a long-standing effort, but it really was uh, crystallized in our, in our 2021 uh, decisions on NATO's 2030 approach, where we actually committed to strengthening the rules-based international order that we so consider the bedrock of global security by working together with these like-minded partners in the Indo-Pacific region to tackle shared security challenges. Um, we've taken a lot of steps forward uh, in, in the last year or so on, on, these, uh, on our relations with the Indo-Pacific. But when thinking um, about uh, what can NATO and partnership with the Republic of Korea do to support President Jun's approach to inter-Korean relations, uh, I thought about sort of two aspects of, of what, we're, what we are doing uh, with the Republic of Korea. And the first is on the political side. I think, you know, it's, um, it's vital, as we've done in the past, that NATO continues to make clear from a political and public perspective that we stand in solidarity with the Republic of Korea's goal of the complete demutualization of the Korean Peninsula. Um, on that political side as well, um, NATO has always had a long-standing approach uh, and, and role to play in arms control and non-proliferation efforts um, that though do play a fundamental role in strengthening security and international order. So NATO, the tools we have, the political tools that NATO has include our efforts to continue to strengthen sanctions, reinforce the legitimacy and primacy of existing arms control agreements and proliferate, uh, and particularly the, uh, the NPT in this respect. Also, on the political topic here, it's important, I think, that the North Korea issue stays on NATO's agenda. We're not an Indo-Pacific security organization, and nor do we have any intention of becoming a military power in the region. We, NATO remains Euro-Atlantic focused. But I think, again, drawing on our new strategic concept, the, the clarity that, that security developments in the Indo-Pacific can directly affect Euro-Atlantic security is, is a reason why it's so important for the Republic of Korea to keep raising awareness at NATO and among allies of uh, DPRK's DP destabilizing activities, as well as uh, Republic of Korea's approach to that. So as well as the political aspect of, of NATO Republic of Korea relations, there's also the practical things that, that we do together that, that do and, and can bolster our mutual security. So um, going back to the arms control topic, we have a political role on arms control, but we also have a practical role as NATO on arms control. We're a forum for political consultation, information sharing and coordination. And we have a continuing and really active discussion about modern proliferation challenges. But we also support our allies and partners in actually developing military capabilities that are essential to effective arms control and counterproliferation, such as interdiction. On um, CBRN defense, chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear defense, that is, we're committed to, to continuing our robust practical cooperation with the Republic of Korea on that, um, focusing on working together to strengthen our capabilities for defending against chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear threats. But also more broadly, we have uh, strengthened our commitment to working together more closely with our Asia-Pacific partners to tackle shared mutual security challenges in this multilateral format. So we have relations with the Republic of Korea and bilaterally, but we also have this multilateral uh, format grouping that is increasingly coming to the fore when we deal with such a broad uh, you know, uh, challenges, uh, cross-regional cross challenges. Um, we're also we're particularly looking at stepping up our cooperation on topics like cyber defense, uh, technologies, uh, and, and hybrid. Because we're, you know, we think by sharing best practices, by consulting more on the challenges, and looking at new ways of working together, we can actually face these challenges in our respective regions better. So, a short note on going forward, um, NATO and the Republic of Korea, of course, both face deeply challenging security environments at the moment. But in facing these difficult circumstances, I think we also share a common commitment to upholding the rules-based international order. And, and we do, you know, we, we are sharing a common will to do more against this backdrop and against this kind of common interest of, of the rules-based international order. At the moment, we're, we're working to finalize our new partnership frameworks and, uh, and the Republic of Korea is, uh, is, is shortly going to be opening a new mission to NATO as announced by President Yoon at, at the NATO summit in July. So just to conclude, I think strong multilateral efforts are really vital in the current security environment. Um, they're vital because they underline the global unity um, 
uh, you know, in the face of attempts to destabilize regional security. And, uh, and, and we have to continue doing this and showing unity against those who would, who so seek to undermine uh, our values, our interests, and our security, even if it's in different regions. Okay, thanks, Sophie. Okay, thank you, thank you, Sophie. Thank you to the panelists for three very interesting, uh, three very interesting presentations. So now I want to move on to uh, questions and answers and open it up to the floor. Uh, maybe just just before I have a I have a question that the uh, all three all three panel panel members all three speakers have a have a common position that the uh, uh, North Korea needs to comply with the United Nations Security Council resolutions of 2017 calling for. The, the nuclear, the nuclearization, and uh, the, the carrot under the audacious initiative is the uh, is the uh, economic cooperation, the prospects of economic cooperation, economic aid. The, the stick is the is the is the sanctions. Um, but we see over the past two years, especially this year, that North Korea has staged so many tests of weapons of mass destruction, everything short of a nuclear test, so many, so many tests of different types of weapons. It, it seems that even in a, in a situation of unprecedented suffering for the society under COVID, the, the closure, the closure of the border, uh, the, the, uh, the strictest ever sanctions, the regime still finds resources for the weapons of mass destruction program for, the, for, its, own, for its own survival. So I just wonder whether whether the sanctions, you know, really will get North Korea into the position whereby it would consider the, the, the South Korean audacious initiative seriously, because it seems that the, uh, when the, the sanctions are very tight, when the economic situation is very, very desperate, the people suffer, but the regime doesn't actually, doesn't actually suffer. And the, the idea of sanctions is the people become disgruntled, then there's prospect of a uh, you know, of them destabilizing and overturning the regime. But that doesn't seem to have occurred in the case of North Korea. So I just wonder whether the, the sanctions is really an effective trigger mechanism into getting the North Koreans to think seriously about denuclearization with the prospect of, you know, the carrot of uh, economic cooperation. So yeah. any, any, anyone would like to uh, just take that one. I'm, yeah. I'll go ahead. <laughs> So having, <laughs> having worked on this issue for so long, um, I feel that uh, people are quite um, disgruntled, if you will, about all that was going on with regard to negotiations and its failures. But at the end of the day, as uh, Professor uh, Kong mentioned, you need both carrots and sticks uh, to resolve this issue. And um, at one point, uh, especially leading up to the talks between uh, the US and, and North Korea at the presidential level, um, it was a very uh, serious uh, military and political atmosphere. Uh, they were talking about fire and fury and, 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 and taking out uh, cities with nuclear weapons, but they sat down for talks. Um, at the time, we think that the sanctions were beginning to bite because China was on board. Um, uh, as you know, over 90 some percent of North Korea's economy is dependent on China. So if you don't have China on board, it, I mean, you can stop nuclear materials and technology and related matters from crossing into the border uh, from other countries. But if China is not fully on board, it doesn't really um, have much effect economically was our thinking then. Um, what had happened was uh, they were getting desperate and sanctions were starting to bite because China was not importing their coal. They were mm. not giving them enough fuel. And so they turned to the US and to South Korea to see what they could do. They sat down at the negotiation tables. And so we know that sanctions can have an effect. Mm. As Professor Kong just mentioned though, um, in recent months or years, when um, they closed their borders because of COVID, uh, they somehow muddled through, um, even without the help of China. So they cut off their border from China, but they realized that, hey, maybe we could just carry on, uh, you know, economically. Uh, the people, um, you know, don't suffer as much as they had an anticipated with, even if they don't have as much 
uh, relations economically with China. So that might have emboldened them a little bit. Um, but as you know, with the current situation at the Security Council with Russia, um, it will be very difficult to pass uh, another UN Security Council resolution if North Korea goes ahead with its next uh, nuclear test. But that doesn't mean we should stand idle. Um, we have uh, in place uh, a long list of uh, sanctions that we could take up if they go ahead with the, with the test. And we have been um, coordinating with the United States uh, uh, and our like-minded countries, including the UK, to see what um, autonomous sanctions we can uh, impose on North Korea. So it, you know, the, the new entities, new organizations will be included and it will affect them. But sanctions is not the only uh, sticks. We all, we're also looking at how they're uh, funding uh, these weapons programs and we realize that uh, a lot of it comes from uh, illicit cyber activities and other, um, uh, and even some, they hire, their, their IT workers are hired by unknowing companies and they generate revenue and uh, repatriate this revenue. So we're actually uh, monitoring everything and we're sharing a lot of this information with our, with our allies and like-minded countries to crack down on the, the sources of their funding. So if they don't have enough resources to carry on, then it would, they would start thinking about, well, what, you know, uh, if sticks start to work, then they'll think about, okay, then what can you give me for carrots? Because we have to make them believe that having nuclear weapons is not an asset, but it's a liability. Um, unfortunately, uh, there have been some uh, bad historical examples with regard to nuclear states, de facto ones. As you know, uh, Israel, India, and Pakistan, they're not P5 members, but they're nuclear states. And uh, somehow they're in good relations with the United States. So. North Korea is thinking, well, if you give up your nuclear weapons, you become a Ukraine, a, a, a Libya, or you know, a South Africa. But if you hold on to it, maybe I can become the next friend of the United States. So they would like to have this kind of best of both worlds, but we have to make sure that they, they as I once said uh, earlier, we have to make them believe that having this thing will be more burdensome than giving it up because it's basically their only card that they have that they can use. So what, like I said, if we impose sanctions, if we start you know, tackling uh, their funding of their resources and they're in dire straits economically and they cannot fund these programs any longer, then it will be very difficult for them to carry out in this belligerent manner. Then we can say, let's sit down, let's talk, let's see what we can do. And, um, I won't go into what the differences are between Audacious Initiative and our past negotiations uh, right yet, but there is a big difference, and I think there's enough carrots in there um, if we sit down and talk for them to, to be genuinely interested. Um, before I conclude, if we look at the patterns in the past, um, they really ramped up their aggression and belligerent behavior before they sat down for talks. So if they carry, carry out their nuclear experiment, it, it, would, it could be a pretense for you know, dialogue. Uh, that, that's the pattern that they've been uh, using all along. So we always tell them the doors to dialogue are open. Uh, we were willing to talk about everything and we wanna correct the flaws that we had in the past with regard to past agreements and negotiations, um, not only to benefit the international community, Korea and the US, but also uh, give North Korea some more carrots, if you will, that they could use and that could help their people. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. So now this is open to the floor. Are there any questions? Just at the, at the, back, at the back there. Please uh, uh, say your name and identify which organization you're from. Uh, all right. Uh, hi, my name is Baron and I'm coming from the War Studies Department of Kings. And my question will be, do you think that it's possible to, for any de defense organization to be funded in the Asia-Pacific region to create more deterrence against these type of military aggressions in the region? Okay. Uh, who, 
is a possibility for a new type of uh, international organization to be... Uh, to So the crea creation of something like the Quad or Quad Plus in the, in the region, uh, or such organizations that can deter aggressive actions by countries like North Korea. Okay. Would any of the panelists like to take sure. this one? Yeah, there, Sophie? Yeah, I, can, I can take that one. No, it's, it's a really interesting question, and it's, uh, it's something that's, um, you know, that, that's kind of long been, uh, been thought about by, by the media and things like that, about whether, you know, uh, you... Um, you could have similar organizations to NATO, for example, in, in the Asia in the Asia Pacific region. I mean, as I've said, what I first said is in my uh, in my opening intervention goes back to that NATO is is very in, you know Euro Atlantic security focused, obviously, but it's been a it's been a bulwark of security in the Euro Atlantic for for generations. And so you know those um, multilateral alliances, of course, do do bring you know uh, benefits to to bringing together very like-minded countries. Uh, on the basis of values and interests and common security concerns, but I don't think you can replicate it exactly in, in the in the in the uh, in the Indo-Pacific region. Obviously, it's a very different um, a different uh, political context, different types of relations. And I think what's really uh, interesting in the in the current security environment is is how uh, relations between like-minded partners in the uh, Indo-Pacific region are getting are strengthening. Um, I think uh, you know. Uh, what we've seen um, for, from the NATO perspective is, uh, is a willingness from uh, the four Asia Pacific partners uh, we have as NATO, so Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and the Republic of Korea, uh, to, to in the last few years to, to, to come together at NATO uh, and have dialogue with us about Indo Pacific security concerns. Um, now again, that's not to say that they will become an alliance, but it's an interesting to see how, how in response to Obviously, Western security relations, like-minded countries have seen that interest in the Indo-Pacific to have increasing dialogue. Um, we uh, seen meetings actually without NATO of the Asia-Pacific partners, in, including in the region and about topics uh, of other there that they're interested in. Um, so yeah, it's it's a, it's a really interesting question. It's it's it goes you know very much to, to the countries in the region themselves. Um, <coughs> but uh, but for sure, you know, there's a there's a common. Uh, interest from NATO's perspective in discussing with those partners what they see uh, in that multilateral framework. We think it's very, uh, very helpful, uh, as well as on the bilateral side. Um, you know, but uh, I think uh, circumstances are such that, that, you know, maybe not in formal alliances, but certainly in, 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 in like-minded groupings to come together increasingly to deal with those challenges. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can I give us uh, just one comment from my side? I think um, by trying to answer your question, I think we really have to zoom out and look at the very broad picture. And um, obviously, we have not now been discussing this in any great detail, but the uh, issue of DPRK or this nuclear program is part of the much wider picture of uh, the relationship between uh, the United States uh, primarily and China, uh, and I would rather say than the West and China uh, and its allies. Eh? So I think the, the big question is, um, what can we do to make this relationship work to the best uh, possible, in the best possible way? Um, and uh, I do understand that uh, President Biden now in the margins of G20 uh, was amongst others also intending to discuss DPRK matters. I would suspect strongly that he has called on China to uh, play a constructive role, meaning uh, not to condone uh, these uh, further testing uh, by DPRK. So uh, I just want to bring out a lot will depend uh, on, on this overall relationship and the element of alliances and fun, fin financing of individual alliances, be it AUKUS, be it the Quad and Quad Plus and so on, is, is to be seen in this context. Uh, this is a crucial relationship and it is a critical time. We are at a critical moment. We, we really don't know exactly how this relationship will evolve going forward. But from what I read, uh, uh, the, you know, this event, uh, this uh, G20 summit is just taking place. Uh, the overall atmospherics uh, were, basic, were basically okay between President Biden and, and President Xi, which I take as an encouraging sign. But it's not yet uh, 
at all a program uh, to, uh, to allow us to say uh, China would contribute to the denuclearization of the PRK. And perhaps just one comment also on the sanctions. It's entirely true with, uh, I, I agree entirely with what Councillor Park has said. He has all, all said it very well, you know. It is indeed so that we have to try to make a, a liability for the PRK uh, that it has a nuclear program. There are no benefits uh, in it. There should not be benefits for it in this program. And then it is under pressure to, to, to give it up, the program. Um, and um, I, I think really there is, um, you know, we, we have been from the EU side also taking autonomous sanctions. And I do understand in the current situation where the Security Council is not uh, in a position due to the blockage from China and by China and Russia to take a decision that indeed, as Councillor Park said, uh, the Republic of Korea is working with others, United States, United Kingdom to mention, to see what can be done in terms of autonomous measures. Though so it's quite interesting to see that to the extent that the um, Security Council is not uh, functioning as it should normally and would, uh, that there is an effort on the way to find an uh, ad hoc solution. But I still believe that um, overall um, the situation is such uh, that uh, on the one hand clearly the sanctions do work we should not we should not assume they don't work at all they do work they exert pressure and this is why kim jong un was so keen to get rid of them over many years and that was his main a goal in the negotiations with President Trump to get rid of sanctions, at least, at least partially, so there is an impact. Let's not forget this, there is an impact. Secondly, we have had to acknowledge that uh, our sanctions and the EU has been very active in this field, also through autonomous sanctions, uh, not only by transposing the United Nations mandated sanctions. We have seen that we can go only so far if China is not on board. That's very clear. There is a lifeline China has been giving. And it's true also that uh, Korea, North Korea has been self-isolating in the, in the, during the COVID period. So there were quite uh, uh, tough sanctions imposed, and nevertheless, Kim Jong-un was willing to press ahead. So what does it mean? It means, um, it means that this program for him is very important, and he want, does not want to give up. And the Ukraine context is, of course, a situation where he has to ask himself, if he looks at Ukraine, if nu Ukraine would have kept its nuclear weapons, probably it would not have faced the, uh, the uh, military attack by Russia. So I, I fear personally that uh, Kim Jong-un is drawing the wrong conclusion, or the conclusion I don't like to see him draw, uh, drawing from this uh, Ukraine uh, war in Ukraine. Uh, but all this to say uh, that uh, it's fundamentally important that this relationship between the United States and China is moving forward in a constructive way with the support of, uh, of course, of South Korea and also of the European Union, amongst others. Thank you very much. Uh, questions from the floor. Uh, we have two, two. Maybe we can take both, both questions. Thank you, panelists, for your very insightful um, talks. My name is Suhyun Lee. I am at Inter um, Department of European and International Studies at King's College London. Um, panelists, you have mentioned, rightly mentioned, the important role of China playing in this promoting peace in Korean Peninsula and in the world. And yesterday, um, President Biden and Xi met uh, ahead of G20 mm -hmm. summit in Bali. And after their talk, um, there was a press conference held where Biden was asked to what extent he believed China had the capacity to talk Pyongyang out of conducting another um, missile test. And he said he, he, believe, he doesn't believe that China quite had the capacity to control North Korea. Is it right? And on that extension, is there anything that US or the new um, UN government in South Korea or EU can do to motivate and incent incentivize China to, um, to um, play a greater role in facilitating, promoting peace on the Korean Peninsula using their, um, greater, uh, using their influence over North Korea? Thank you. Okay, and the second question. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. First and foremost, my name is Giovanni Vasita. I'm a postgraduate international politics student at SOAS. My question is, in regards to the interconnectedness and interdependence of the Republic of Korea and the United States, we observe that one of the main tenets of the interest of the DPRK when at the round table is the removal of the United States from the question of the Korean unification, from the question of Korean reunification. Why must we continuously justify and rationalize the, rationalize the quixotic interjection of the West in the uniquely Korean question? 
should there not be a self-determinate Korean future free from the foreign influence, seeing as how the split of Korea was a result of a foreign intervention in itself? Okay, thank you. Two very interesting questions. One about the role of uh, China. Can China actually influence the, the North Koreans on the weapons of mass destruction? And what incentives can be given to China to do more? And the second one about the, 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 the issue of the Kore divided Korea is an issue for the Koreans th themselves to, to settle rather than through the uh, intervention of external, external forces. So we'll take the first, first question on China. Any, anyone? I'll try. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So President um, Biden said, with I'm regard not to sure China, China can um, influence. When I was involved in the six-party talks, they were very eager to to uh, to try to resolve this issue, and they tried their best um, to do what they can. But I think uh, they were quite frustrated later um, when the, um, the talks, uh, the the principles could not be implemented. Um, and at a later point, uh, they changed their position. And as Ms. Lee mentioned, um, they've been saying for quite some time that this issue should be resolved between the US and North Korea directly. Um, no matter what their rhetoric or position is, China does have an important role to play. Mm. Um, but uh, we shouldn't overestimate or under underestimate their influence on North Korea. Um, there are a lot of naysayers on, uh, who say that uh, China doesn't have as much influence as uh, people believe on North Korea. Somewhat true, but as I mentioned earlier, a lot of their economy <laughs> is dependent on China. So even if their leaders and their uh, elites um, you know, don't see eye to eye on, on, on some issues with North Korean leaders, um, they still can have an effect on their economy and they can do something about uh, what North Korea does. As you can see, they prepared, North Korea prepared everything for a nuclear test, but they didn't carry this out because they had a third party Congress in China. So you can see that this kind of uh, influence is, is there. Um, and so we need to play this card out and, and try to get China more on board, if not fully on board, to tackle this issue. And I think um, if they carry out a nuclear test, China will not be pleased. Um, they have shown uh, there's a displeasure and passed the UN Security Council resolutions. Uh, they were on board. So we'll see what North Korea's next move is, but I think it's very important to get China on board and we should get them on board. Um, with regard to uh, the United States, the second question. As you know, uh, U.S. is a party to the armistice agreement. So even if um, you know some uh, in both Koreas uh, would like to resolve uh, the Korean Peninsula issue uh, amongst ourselves, uh, because they are a signatory to the armistice agreement, and more importantly, because they are a very stout ally of the Republic of Korea, and they are a very important actor in the international scene even with regard uh, to North Korea, even, even if, uh, from their perspective, it would be important to get uh, the United States involved in any kind of uh, peace negotiations, whether it be for your reunification or for uh, denuclearization, whatever it may be, America has a very important role to play, I believe. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, very, two very brief comments from my side, if I may. Um, I, I agree again with Councillor Park. We should neither overestimate nor underestimate the influence that China has on DPRK. Uh, an example for this is that uh, Kim Jong-un traveled uh, several times to Beijing uh, in the context of uh, the Trump negotiations with uh, Kim Jong-un. So it was very clear that he was coordinating uh, his position. He was trying to see what China, what Kim, uh, President Xi would say. And he has taken, I suspect, he has had to factor this into his um, approach towards uh, the engagement with President Trump. So that's a clear example, uh, indeed, that uh, the DPRK takes into account uh, at least the views, or at least has to, I, I believe, has to take into account uh, President uh, Xi's and China's views. And indeed, uh, the trade, uh, that is still ongoing, and there is very little ongoing because uh, DPRK has been self-isolating itself more recently due to the COVID uh, pandemic. But whatever there is ongoing, essentially, it's trade with China. So that is uh, indeed a very important uh, element of the calculus that 
um, that uh, DPRK um, must uh, make. Now, the second comment, uh, of course, the European Union is not a party to the Korea War. That's obvious. Huh? Um, but at the same time, um, you know, uh, whatever helps overcome the conflict uh, will find the support of the European Union. And if this audacious initiative would take off, I'm pretty sure the European Union would be willing to help with all what it can bring in terms of experience of peacemaking. Let's not forget the European Union is itself a peace project. There's a lot of expertise available on how to overcome conflict, how to engage with others, how to make cooperation work, how to bring in trade, how to bring in investment, uh, also how to deliver in assistance. There is a lot that you could bring to the table and would certainly be willing to do it. I have absolutely no doubt. Um, then also, as regards um, the question, isn't the peace on the Korean Peninsula an issue primarily for North and South Korea? Yes, it is. I believe so. But uh, let's not forget reality. Uh, DPRK is, is obsessively focused on, on, on the United States, which is an advantage and a disadvantage. Eh? But it is clearly so that um, for, D, for DPRK, for Kim Jong-un, uh, whatever the US would do or how it would position itself towards this uh, possible negotiation of a peaceful um, solution, if it comes, let's see. Uh, would uh, play an important role. So I, I clearly think, uh, of course, the US unavoidably will have to be part of uh, not necessarily the negotiations themselves, but must be very closely associated. And I, I find it very difficult, in fact, that they would not be involved themselves directly. Yeah? Final comment as well from my side, if that's okay, in response to the, the question about, about the US. Um, it, it's, of course, it's, yeah, as you say, completely a, a an issue first and foremost for, for the Korean Peninsula. But I do think it's important to remember that, that, that all countries have the right to choose their own allies, right? It's not for any third party to come in and say, um, you know, you, you, you can't be allied with this. I mean, we see this off, uh, very much in the uh, disinformation sphere in the Euro-Atlantic area, where Russia, of course, blames part of the, the conflict in Ukraine for, uh, for NATO as an alliance and, uh, and, and, and Ukraine's wish to, to join the alliance. So I think in the same way, it's, it's important to, uh, to, keep, uh, to keep that sphere that you know, sovereign countries have the right to, to choose their alliances, and the Republic of Korea has the right to, to choose the relations with the US, and, and that, uh, as, as every sovereign country does around the globe. So, um, you know, and, and with the Korean uh, war situation, just you know, remember going back to, to the very beginning where the UN played such an important role in, in the beginning um, as well, so it, it has long been an issue of such supreme importance, I think, for the global community as well. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we'd like to take more questions from the floor. Right, so two questions at the back there. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mihao. I study politics here at King's. Now, it was mentioned that there is a lack of consensus in the UN Security Council regarding DPRK right now. My question is, do you think that additional sanctions and perhaps the initiative as a whole could potentially have the opposite effect of increasing these tensions and maybe even driving the DPRK to deepen its relationship with China, with Russia as a sort of countermeasure, right? Especially since it seems to me instinctively that if the DPRK would be interested in modernization and a further economic support, those would probably be the countries they would first go to. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And a second question, please. Yes. Hello, um, I'm Eve, and I am a master's student in international relations. Uh, my question is um, regarding NATO. So um, in the context of you know, the war um, in Ukraine, um, I'm just wondering, NATO's involvement in the Indo-Pacific, is, is that kind of stretching its remit beyond the North Atlantic um, area, which uh, is like its primary focus, and how is NATO managing um, its remit both in the North um, Atlantic as well as in Indo-Pacific? Okay, thank, thank you. you. Maybe we can take the NATO question first, whether sure. it's, uh, its remit is overextended. Yes, of course. Remit. Of course, but I'm absolutely happy to, to take that question. Um, so, so just to make clear that we're not intending to become a, an Indo-Pacific security organization, NATO is, is firmly focused on, on the Euro-Atlantic security organization. 
But at the same time, as I mentioned in my intervention, we've had long-standing partner relations with, with countries from uh, uh, around the globe. Um, and I think in the last two years especially, um, NATO has made clear that we are reaching out to the Indo-Pacific increasingly, uh, you know, in, in the context of our decisions on NATO 2030, which is very much looking at how, the, um, how global security is, is uh, under deep challenge, especially from the perspective of the rules-based international order, the structures that have served us, you know, so well, uh, uh, you know, since the end of the Second World War are, are under deep tension on a, at the global level. And, we, we see great, uh, you know, uh, shared interest with our partners in the Indo-Pacific, and that's why in later 2030 decisions, we said we wanted to work more closely uh, with them, both politically and practically, in terms of, you know, our dialogue, but also tackling key security challenges together. So I would say it's not about NATO extending to the Indo-Pacific. It's about NATO recognizing that we share a lot of interest with our Indo-Pacific partners, and we want to work more closely on those cross-cutting global challenges that don't respect borders of countries anymore and that we, we can work together with them on. So, um, so yes, of course, the, 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 the Euro-Atlantic security situation is as our primary, uh, primary concern. But I think it, that also has, has global implications. You know, we, we've seen uh, for our partners in the Indo-Pacific also willingness to, uh, to, um, to uh, show unity with, uh, with NATO, with Ukraine. Um, <laughs> in the context, including with our recent NATO summit in Madrid, where they, the four partners participated for the first time together uh, to discuss, you know, the global implications of this conflict. And, and of course, it's an important, for I think, for our partners to be able to come to NATO and share their regional perspectives on, on key security issues. Of course, uh, the uh, DPRK's activities are one of the primary things that we're, we're interested in going on in the Indo-Pacific region as well. Um, so yeah, it's important for both sides, but not in a way of extending to the Indo-Pacific region, staying firmly in the Euro-Atlantic, but with, a, of course, a global perspective that I think we, we all need to have today. Thank you. Yeah, uh, two very quick comments from my side. Uh, first point, I uh, also uh, I understand that NATO um, has a strong interest also in taking on board the experience that Korea and Australia and Japan have been making with China. They know China very well. It's the first trade partner. They know many, they're well aware of the security issues surrounding the relationships with China. So I believe uh, there is a lot uh, NATO can take on board, as we as the EU can take on board in engaging with these countries specifically. Now to the first question, um, would uh, the uh, imposition of new sanctions, uh, and we may well see this after a, a seventh nuclear test, whether on how this will play out in New York, my, uh, my sense is there will not be a consensus um, again in the Security Council, unfortunately, let's see. Would this uh, further antagonize the relationship uh, between uh, DPRK and, and, and the United States and South Korea uh, or, or not? Eh? My own sense is that, um, you know, if uh, this, uh, DPRK would have seen a chance to get more out of its relationship with China um, than it presently gets, I think they would have tried already hard, and they tried certainly hard. I, I don't expect that there is a lot of uh, room, but there's so much more they can get out of this relationship unless the global context changes dramatically further. And that is, of course, something we cannot entirely anticipate for now. Um, with regard to the UN Security Council uh, resolutions, um, of course, uh, we would pursue a, a UN Security Council resolution if North Korea goes ahead with a nuclear test. Um, I'm not saying that we should forego that process and, and go at it in an autonomous way. Uh, rather, um, we will definitely, uh, or Security Council members should definitely pursue this. However, the reality is uh, there's a very high likelihood that Russia will veto uh, such a, a resolution. That's why I talked about the autonomous measures that we can take up in, in such a case. Um, just as an interesting side note, uh, October has been a very prolific month in terms of how uh, North Korea um, showed its relations with China and Russia there are very important events that went on, and there were exchanges of letters, uh, uh, there are many news articles, uh, sending flowers, um, you know, having face-to-face -face events. So if I may just mention uh, some of them, uh, National Day of China was on the first. Uh, the, rela uh, the establishment of diplomatic relations between uh, North Korea and China was on the sixth. Putin's birthday was on the seventh. 
um, North Korea's foundation of its uh, party was on the 10th. Uh, diplomatic relations between Russia and uh, North Korea was on the 12th. China, of course, had its th third party Congress in October. Um, and uh, China's entering of the Korean War anniversary was on the 25th. And so you could see, you know, there were very, very important events with regard to uh, China uh, Russia relations. And it, we could see that how close they become. Perhaps uh, w with regard to Russia, it's, I think it's been the closest since the end of the Cold War, because as you know, North Korea is, is one of the few countries that are outright supporting uh, uh, Russia's um, uh, aggression into Ukraine. So having said that, uh, yes, they, they, they are close, closer than before, but it doesn't mean that uh, you know, they would start another Cold War, another bloc. Um, as, as you just saw yesterday, um, you know, U.S. is talking with China. Um, so, you know, we're not saying this is a new dichotomy where we have a new Cold War on our hands. I think there's still ways and measures that we can uh, talk to China or even Russia, for that matter, with regard to uh, the North Korean nuclear issue. And we are doing so, actually, bilaterally um, behind the scenes. Um, before I, I finish, let me just briefly say, nobody's asking this question, what the difference is between the, the audacious initiative and past um, uh, negotiations. So if we look back at the G Geneva Agree framework uh, made between the United States and North Korea, this was basically a program to, to freeze their nuclear capabilities in return for building a light water reactor that would take the place of its... Uh, uh, of, of its five megawatt uh, graphite uh, reactor. This didn't uh, go through because, as you know, um, U.S. is blaming North Korea, North Korea is blaming the U.S. But there were events, you know, uh, unfortunate events that took place that, you know, had this uh, agreement fall apart. That's why we had the six-party talks. And I was there on the, on the, uh, on the eve of the September 19th agreement all the principles were there. Basically, we, North Korea agreed to give up its nuclear weapons in return for security guarantees and uh, energy assistance. That's the gist of it. The reason why this didn't happen was because in later subsequent negotiations, um, there was a big fight between which comes first, the chicken or the egg. And you know, um, we couldn't come to terms with how we're going to send the heavy fuel or how we're going to build, generate electricity for them, and what steps they're going to do. It, it actually started uh, to be implemented in the beginning. We did send uh, shipments of, of heavy fuel oil, and they did blow up their uh, tower. So we, we could see that there was some sincere sincerity on both sides to, to see this through. But you know, once again, circumstances weren't right. That's why we're saying this time around, it should be different. Um, so we're saying, let's talk, put everything on the table you know, and, and negotiate it out. Um, might take a little time, but we'll have everything there. And then we'll see what we can do to implement. And there'll be countervailing measures for non-compliance, which wasn't really uh, clear in, in the previous uh, six-party talks agreement. And there will be some initial measures at the beginning when they do halt their reactors, when they do you know, stop their reprocessing and, and take steps, because th this has to be done in steps. Um, the previous U U.S. administration, especially Mr. Bolton, wanted N uh, North Korea to give everything up first, and then they'll think about what to give them. That's not, you know, even if you're not North Korea, it, it's not something that, you know, a negotiating party could buy, I mean. So because of the big difference in their uh, positions, the Hanoi uh, negotiations mm -hmm. fell apart. North Korea was ready to, you know, uh, get rid of their Yongbyon facilities. U.S. said, you have to strip yourself of everything before we can even think about what to do. So, you know, that's why we're saying, um, because, as I said, South Korea was so deeply involved in all these negotiations, um, and we have experts uh, both in government and, and, and elsewhere, that have looked into this issue, this issue for so long, we know what steps we need to take and how to do this. And every time there's a new administration in the United States or wherever, um, we coordinate our response with them.
because we have a long institutional memory, and they do as well, obviously. And so we work very closely together to learn from past mistakes and carry forward. And I think that in that regard, the Audacious Initiative is a very comprehensive and holistic approach, and I hope mm -hmm. that uh, North Korea will, be, uh, will show more interest in uh, what it has to offer. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, do, are, we, are we up for time? All right, okay. Uh, well, thanks for, thanks for all your interesting questions, and please show your appreciation to the speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks again to our speakers and for your questions. Ladies and gents, um, there's tea and coffee over in the corner there, so please go and help yourself. We've got about 15 minutes.
Okay. Thank you, everybody um, who stayed on, and welcome everybody who is now joining us. Just a very quick reminder, um, courtesy of our co-organisers at the Embassy, there are some gift bags at the back there, so when we're done today, please help yourself. Um, and thanks to the Embassy for organising. Our next uh, panel is moderated by uh, Seme Kim. Mm -hmm. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over. Um. Welcome back, everyone. My name is Sami Kim. I'm a former Korea Foundation Fellow at the Royal United Services Institute and a recent graduate at King's College London. I will be moderating the second panel on North Korea's nuclear program, doctrine, technological development, and proliferation. I will first like to introduce our speakers, and then we will have a round of questions from myself to the speakers before we open up the floor for questions from the audience. Um, to my left, we have Dr. Nicola Levenhaus, uh, who is a senior lecturer in East Asian Security and International Relations at the Department of War Studies, King's College London. <coughs> Dr. Levenhaus specializes in nuclear weapons issues uh, in Northeast Asia. And to my right, we have Dr. John Nielsen Wright, who is a senior university lecturer at Cambridge University and a senior research fellow for Northeast Asia and Korea Foundation Korea Fellow with the Asia Pacific Program at Chatham House. Uh, Dr. Nielsen Wright focuses on international relations and alliance ties in Northeast Asia. And to my far right, we have Mr. Joseph Dempsey, who is a defense analyst specializing in open source and imagery analysis of military capabilities. Uh, Mr. Dempsey focuses on North Korea's military developments, particularly tracking the evolution of North Korea's ballistic missile programs. So we are very lucky to have this distinguished group of speakers. I thank you all for joining us to share your expertise, and thank you to the organizers of this conference. Um, I'd now like to start us off with a round of questions. Um, if I could start with uh, Mr. Joseph Dempsey. Um, um, it seems that every year, North Korea carries out numerous missile tests. And as you know, North Korea has launched a record number of missiles this year. Uh, as, uh, I'd like to ask, is this more of the same or is there something that's fundamentally different about this round of provocations? As Councillor pa Park mentioned in the previous panel, is this uh, a tactic to escalate, to then de-escalate? And what is North Korea trying to gain out of these missile launches? Um, thank you very much for the question and uh, thank you for the organisers and of course the uh, Republic of Korean Embassy for inviting us along and for you to attend. Um, so, as outlined, I'm kind of looking at the ballistic missile test, less on the diplomacy side. So this might be a little bit more technical than some of the other speakers. So forgive me, and uh, apologies, I'll try to keep abbreviations uh, to the minimum. In terms of the testing, obviously, it's been an unprecedented year. There's no way, really, other than say that, um, both in terms of what's been launched and in terms of the numbers. However, it does kind of follow a kind of an increasing and worrying trend. And we'll talk a little bit more about what we've seen this year uh, and some of the trends which might kind of explain where we are now and potentially look at where we might be going. So as I said, unprecedented number of ballistic launches this year, um, indicating a range of kind of emergent systems and capabilities, a big diversification of these systems as well, uh, carrying on from what we saw in uh, previous years. Um, it not only shows emergent capabilities, but also, you know, quite tellingly, it also shows some challenges and some limitations that may still exist. And I, I won't draw on that too much, but if someone would like to ask me a question about that, I'd very much like to answer it. Um, so some of the kind of the key systems that we've seen tested, uh, we've seen you know, a return to ICBM testing. We've had at least three categorized ICBM systems tested in March, May, and most recently in November this year. We've also seen an IRBM system um, tested in January, uh, as well as a Japanese, sorry, uh, in October, an overflight to Japan as well. Now, these are the first instance of overflights and ICBM categorized testing since 2017, so for almost five years. And it marks a, you know, a clear end, certainly in the case of the ICBMs, potentially a little bit with the IRBMs as well. Um, it marks a kind of clear end to self-imposed moratorium on long-term testing. Now, coupled with that moratorium was also nuclear testing, um, an agreement to give up, well, a self-declaration to give up that. And whilst it's not been binding, uh, for a long time in terms of North Korean statements. It also hints that now they've returned to long-range uh, long testing, is nuclear the next thing? And obviously, as we've already talked about, and I'm sure we will be talking more about on this panel, the possibility of um, a seventh nuclear test is potentially imminent at any time. Um, 
Interestingly, one of the other things we've seen this year in terms of the testing is the strongest ever indication of um, tactical nuclear forces. Um, this is something that came up at the, um, the Parties work, uh, Workers' Congress recently, one of the many ambitions and stated goals, some of which um, they've already started to move towards in terms of testing and once this is tested. But tactical nuclear force is quite interesting. Most notably, the, the tests in September, October this year were claimed, and again, I mean, everything North Korea says and shows, there's an element of um, being careful taking it to face value. Um, but simulated training and fitting of nuclear warheads, or simulated training, I should point out, um, but also revealing missile systems that notionally are assigned a nuclear role, which has always been a bit ambiguous in the past when it comes to the shorter range systems. Um, I should point out that, you know, particularly when it comes to warheads and being able to do tactical nuclear warheads, this is still a bit of a grey area for North Korea. Yes, they've shown us two warheads notionally, um, a nuclear warhead and also a thermonuclear warhead, whether they work, whether actually the systems they've tested in the six nuclear tests relate to these in any way or look like these or have similar claims is very unclear. Reducing that to fit into a missile and making a compact warhead, um, where exactly they are at that is unclear. And the ability to do it at a, kind of a more tactical level for small warheads uh, is particularly questionable. And when we're talking about what we're talking about in terms of physical size, they've said um, some of the cruise missiles they've launched have a strategic role. They've even said some of their MRLS systems, uh, sorry, multiple rocket launcher systems um, have a nuclear role. And when you talk about the, the large caliber rocket launcher, we're talking about a diameter of 60 centimeters, so about this. So we're talking particularly compact warheads potentially. Um, so there are some caveats about where they are at that and what their ambition actually is. In terms of actually how many um, missiles have been launched, obviously there's been a lot. I have a very busy spreadsheet, um, which is getting increasingly challenging for reasons I'll go on to talk about. Um, in terms of ballistic missile launchers, um, His Excellency the Ambassador said 61 earlier, which I really appreciate him saying, <laughs> because my estimate was around the 50-60 mark in terms of ballistic missiles launched. Um, that's twice as many as any previous year by a long margin. Um, and just to put it in context, in 2021, there was probably only about eight, we think. The 50 to 60 that was a bit of a conservative estimate. And there are other larger estimates out there, particularly when we look at what was tested earlier in this month. And um, because there's a lot of that would include kind of long range, multiple rocket launcher systems, which, depending which side of the defense you fall on in terms of classifications, are ballistic missiles or they are just guided um, rockets. Um, and they, particularly North Korea's development of the MLS systems, um, the guided long-range MLS systems, really blurred the lines between what is a MLS system or tactical artillery rocket and what is a ballistic missile. Um, and that kind of leads on to the kind of increasing ambiguity about what North Korea is actually testing, um, what they're launching and what numbers. And it's heightened not just by the volume, but also their own reporting of it, which has changed over the last couple of years. Increasingly, they're not acknowledging a system has been tested, and not even showing the system. Actually, a couple of years ago, they stopped showing us videos as well, which for image analysts like me, makes it even more challenging, even more ambiguous. Um, they've only shown, I think, in the last year, two videos. Um, previously, state media would show one of every launch, virtually. Um, they're also, when, even when they are telling us about the, um, the launches, particularly in the last few months, it's also kind of a retrospective bulk update as we've seen in you know, September launches, as we've seen uh, just last week, which are harder for analysts to essentially unpack, to marry up the South Korean statements with the Japanese statements, to marry up, um, to mar and then marry up with what actually North Korea is showing, match the pictures to the tests. Uh, it's quite a hard work. Um, also, there's ever present caveats to what is shown and stated. Images can be manipulated. There's certainly been some reuse of um, archive imagery in the last week on some of the, uh, the tests, uh, but also we you know that failures also, can also be held as successes or you know, within the test parameters. Um, and notably, there's also a decreasing presence of King Jong-un. If we look back you know, to, to 2017, he was at every single missile launch uh, that we know of. Um, and the fact they're not, he's not attending, the fact they're not showing us or not showing us in the same way, uh, and Bashar we're basically conducting more uh, tests is kind of a normalization of this testing, and that's one of the, kind of the key themes. So it kind of desensitizes audiences, 
Uh, we've already seen the kind of reactions change internationally, I think, um, about, well, it's just another North Korean missile launch. Whereas previously, if it had been done five years ago, six years ago, the reaction would be quite different, certainly how it's covered in media and uh, other outlets. It's interesting also that, you know, when we look at November, what happened just last week, um, it was quite startling in terms of the number of missiles launched. 33 projectiles or missiles were launched, but it's also interesting that, to kind of break that figure down a little bit, and I think it's been misconstrued by some um, reporting. It's possible that North Korea only actually acknowledged 11 ballistic missiles, but a larger number of MLS and a larger number of uh, SAM systems. Um, interestingly, particularly is um, the danger of this kind of testing, particularly when there's heightened tensions on the peninsula, and particularly the, the danger of misidentification of systems, but also intentions. And the, perhaps the prime example of this is what happened on the 2nd of November. So uh, the Republic of Korea stated that a SRBM had crossed over the uh, northern limit line. And they responded in turn with what they thought what a corresponding and no doubt measured response uh, to launch two air launch cruise missiles at the same uh, point of splashdown in the waters of South Korea. Um, interestingly, North Korea claims to have then responded with two cruise missiles splashing down even further south, some 80 kilometers off the coast of South Korea. That claim is very much unverified. The interesting thing about this is that it's since become revealed um, that uh, that SRBM wasn't an SRBM at all. It was a SAM system, a very long-range legacy Soviet system. And um, it's questionable whether that was the intention of North Korea. Uh, they launched probably about three at the same time. One went south, the other two went north. This system, an SA-5 um, or an S-200, depending on NATO or Russian designations, um, has a history of kind of going astray, shall we say, and keeps going on a kind of ballistic trajectory, so it can be misconstrued as a ballistic missile. We've seen, you know, ones launched in Syria um, end up in Cyprus fairly recently in the last few years, so this does happen. So it's questionable whether that was the intention or whether it's an accidental um, crossing of the NL NLO. Either way, it's the, how that was construed as a SRBM inadvertently and treated as that and the corresponding measures which led to inadvertent potential escalation is quite interesting. It just shows the danger, um, particularly around times when there's other stuff going on. And certainly that probably fueled what we saw in the last few days. Um, <clears throat> I think also we need to look at kind of why North Korea tests. There are different dimensions to every single test, and they're not mutually exclusive. So in no particular order, and they're not saying there are other dimensions here, but the main ones are kind of domestic. So for internal propaganda, to portray strength of the regime and its military. Um, I think also to make a heightened perceived threat uh, from particularly the Republic of Korea, Japan, and the US, and their ability to respond. So that's very much geared towards an internal audience, of course. Although, of course, not showing us the test or telling us about the test actually diminishes that return for the domestic audience. Diplomatically is another dimension. Um, obviously, that's one that I think is certainly heightened by certainly media reporting. Um, I often get media requests about, you know, what does this message mean to Biden? Actually, it just means they want to test a missile sometimes. It's sometimes not more complicated than that. Um, but certainly, they take into, when they, want, they need to test a missile or want to take a missile, they certainly have to take into consideration about the timing of that. And it's noticeable that I think, you know, while sometimes we can delink some of the, the political messaging um, in other times, and certainly in the last few months, it has been clearly linked, the timing at least, not necessarily the need to test has been linked to certain um, instances. So in September, we had the US carrier visit uh, ahead of some joint exercises. And that was the first time I think a US carrier had visited the Republic of Korea since 2017. Uh, we also had the visit of the US VP to the DMZ, which, um, um, sorry, I did say I've tried to limit the abbreviations there. I just realized how many put in that sentence. Um, we had that visit there, which was on, you know, an SRBM was launched on that day. And more recently, we've had the kind of the, the clear sighting uh, by North Korea um, in November about the, the joint vigilant storm exercises with the US. So certainly, they're citing those as a reason why they've done the, these provocations and these tests. However, fundamentally, behind most missile testing is a developmental dimension. These new systems need to be tested. And in most cases, they've only been given the range of systems, the diversity of systems we've seen, some have only been tested a handful of times. 
if you were in any other country, this is not enough to say, yes, this system works, yes, this system is reliable, let's invest in it and mass produce it and deploy it. Um, although North Korea's confidence level of doing that is very much different, and their risk perception is very much different as well. Um, particularly true of their long-range systems. So the ICBMs, for example, have only been tested a real handful of times. The short-range <coughs> systems, more so. And part of that long-range testing is very much limited because of geography. Um, they are constrained by geography to basically they can't conduct tests over about 1,000 kilometers without overflying Japan and, you know, the diplomatic consequences that that entails. Um, so, yes, they're, they're very careful about when they choose to do that, certainly. Um, and as I said, whilst the timing may be done about, they may use, for example, um, cited reasons about joint exercises as a reason to test something that they've been wanting to test for a long time, and they need to test for a long time. Now, sometimes they can just wheel something out quite quickly, like an SRBN that's been tested fairly quickly, but within that test, within the, certainly within the September tests, certainly within the uh, November tests, you know, we've seen a bit of a build-up. Yes, there are short-range tests of systems which are a lot more tested and probably even fielded in case of things like the KN23, um, but they also start to mix in other capabilities in there as well and use that as an excuse to build up so, you know, for example, we saw the IR being tested uh, in September, and then we built up to an ICBM classified system uh, just recently. There's also, to be fair, as I said, developmental testing. It's not always just about testing new systems, but increasingly testing and training crews about more emergent systems as well. KN23 is perhaps the best example of this, and this probably accounts for probably most of the SRBM tests, I'd say. Uh, and it's also evident with some of the MLS tests as well where it's not just about, you know, seeing they work. It's actually about implementing the crews towards deployed systems. And that's another key thing to remember. A lot of these systems we've seen, given the range we've seen, and despite a lot of tests overall, they largely remain untested. And it's very, with the exception of the two systems I made, the KN23 and probably the KN25 MLS, um, the systems we've seen since 2017, 2019 onwards, hard to say if any other ones have actually been fielded in any meaningful numbers, whether they're not just still in development, um, or whether just prototypes, and sometimes there's even competing designs potentially overlapping. So, yeah, in, in conclusion to your, your question, I think it, it certainly, they've raised the stakes in the terms of testing and what they feel they've been able to do. Um, it, but the way they're portraying those tests has changed, um, and it's also worrying about how they will keep doing that moving forward. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to ask a follow-up question after. Um, we have the, another two questions about our ability to defend against these missile threats. Um, uh, okay. So now I'd like to move on to the question of uh, North Korea's nuclear program and ask Dr. <coughs> Weberinghaus. Uh, North Korea has recently announced the revised nuclear doctrine, as Ambassador Yoon mentioned in the opening speech. Um, do you think this indicates a key change to North Korea's nuclear strategy? Um, and what changes can we anticipate from announcing this new nuclear doctrine? Yeah, thank you. Um, maybe. Uh, I think the, the new law um, that, that came out recently increases the potential for change in strategy. Um, but many aspects of the law speak to previous um, things that, that North Korea has been saying. Um, just before I sort of directly answer the question, I'd like to sort of preface it by saying that the use of the law or national legislation to communicate a strategy around nuclear weapons is not uncommon. Uh, many nuclear and non-nuclear weapon states do that. The last time North Korea did that was a long time ago, so you could say it was overdue. Um, China, uh, North Korea amended its constitution in 2012 in order to declare itself a nuclear weapon state. Uh, and it, at that time, it did speak to its nuclear strategy as well as it was emerging. Um, it talked, for instance, about the need to repel um, invasion or attack. There was, a, there was a strong retaliatory tone, I think mm -hmm. you could say, in, in, in that discussion um, ten, 10 years ago. And the new, the new law um, has a slightly different tone, um, less retaliatory, perhaps more preemptive, you know, some analysts have argued that it speaks to a more first use rather than a second use type of strategy, right? So a lot of, a lot of experts often talk about North Korea's emerging nuclear strategy as one of, based on short retaliation, somewhat similar to, say, let's say, what China practices, for instance. 
Um, but, a, but a first use doesn't, doesn't really complement that, right? A first use speaks to a more warfighting type of strategy, arguably one that's more uh, aggressive. Um, and in the actual law, the recent law, it does talk about the importance of um, using these weapons preemptively, potentially, when uh, an, uh, attacks on important uh, strategic objects are imminent, right? And I think that speaks to a specific concern in North Korea that's a new concern that didn't exist in quite the same way in 2012, which is namely growing abilities, particularly in South Korea, to implement successfully a decapitation strategy. What that means, in essence, is that you know, if a crisis were to break out and war were to break out, South Korea would have the ability to um, get rid of the uh, political elite in North Korea, namely Kim Jong-un, targeting uh, the elites and removing them from the equation, right? That has become increasingly realistic uh, from a technical perspective. It's certainly something that has been spoken about as well at a rhetorical level in, 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 a, in a greater sense. And, and it's very clear from this law that that is a preoccupation for North Korea. So, the move, if there is such a move, away from a more retaliatory to a more aggressive warfighting strategy is speaking to that concern of decapitation. What does that mean strategically in terms of what um, changes we should expect? We should expect that um, hair trigger alert, high levels of alert, would be uh, in place on, China, on North Korean nuclear forces. And that, of course, is not a good thing. It's highly escal escalatory. That, increases the risk for accidents and, and misunderstandings and, and, and the like. It's not the first time North Korea has spoken about preemption, so we need to, again, be careful about this. And the law isn't groundbreakingly new in that respect. So, for instance, 2016, when there are military exercises between the United States and South Korea, North Korea spoke about um, preemption. So I think there is a lot of sort of discussion about the potential for a move towards a more preemptive strategy. The second, and I think perhaps more interesting um, change, potential, potential change, um, rests around command and control um, of uh, the emerging nuclear forces in North Korea, in particular what we call the delegation of authority to launch, which is basically a very wordy way of saying who presses the button, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and Kim Jong-un, you know, talks, you know, he's spoken about in the law as having monolithic control, right, over, over, over that decision. Um, and again, this speaks to that decapitation fear, right? So what happens if Kim Jong-un were removed, were killed in an in a early strike? What happens to the decision to use weapons, right, these weapons, nuclear weapons? And in terms of improving the credibility of nuclear deterrence, you need to have a somewhat convincing and credible, and one that has been clearly communicated, delegation of authority to launch. In theory, that would improve your, your deterrence. So the law speaks to um, what seems to be an automatic style of delegation. In other words, this is something that Kim Jong-un will have decided upon already, probably in consultation with others. It does, does, does the law does speak about that process, that there would be a consultation. But he would make the decision and that would automatically be made um, and sort of somewhat like a letter of last resort that the UK has um, if for their uh, nuclear submarines. But, but it would be done beforehand, right? There are other ways of delegating authority uh, to launch. So you could delegate it to other political leaders below you. You could delegate it to the military. They all have different risks, of course. But it seems that the law is speaking to this sort of, again, this monolithic. And I just want to end with two more things beyond the law that I think shape North Korean nuclear policy um, and strategy. The first is China. And I hope we do have time on this panel to talk about China. It's my main area of interest anyway. Um, but for many um, in, in the field, and the relationship, the relationship between North Korea and China when it comes to nuclear weapons is very difficult to decipher. We know that um, when there were visits between Kim Jong-un and Xi Jinping, when Kim Jong-un visited several times China, we know that there were attempts to showcase what China has done with its nuclear weapons capabilities. Um, and we don't know if that was intended simply to impress upon and encourage North Korea to follow China's path. But it clearly shows that this is something that 
you know, Beijing thinks about and, and potentially worries about what type of strategy North Korea will pursue. And some academics and experts have suggested that if North Korea cannot be uh, reliant upon or reassured that it has China as an ally in the event that a crisis would break out with uh, the United States and South Korea, that this would make it turn to a more war-fighting and aggressive-like strategy. So the role of China in, in, Chi in, 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 in North Korea's thinking about its nuclear weapons strategy is potentially significant. The law tells us nothing about that relationship other than to suggest that actually it's not mentioned, right? So the importance of China is not something that is mentioned um, and is not over. And the, and the second issue that the, the law doesn't speak to, of course, but I think is a major issue, is the war in Ukraine. And what lessons is North Korea drawing from Russia and uh, the nuclear signaling and threats, semi-threats, that, uh, that Russia has made around nuclear weapons use. I know that South Korea has been following that. Um, and I think it's an issue that um, some, some, where there's a fear that some countries have taken the wrong lessons for strategy, namely that you can actually speak about these weapons quite loosely uh, in a conflict um, and, and, and get away with that. So beyond the law, I think there are, there are other factors. Mm -hmm. Um, but I can't give you a definitive answer about whether there's a change, simply that I think that the room has increased. There's greater potential for change later down the line. Thank you. Uh, I certainly hope we can touch upon these uh, various other topics like China and war in Ukraine and our question and uh, questions from the audience um, time. And now to Dr. Nielsen Wright. Um, on the other hand, on one hand, we see ties between, for example, Korea, Japan, and the US appearing to grow stronger, as we see in the recent uh, series of bilateral and trilateral summit the past few days. Um, on the other hand, uh, as Dr. Leveringhouse mentioned, Korea's ties, North Korea's ties with China and Russia are also uh, becoming stronger. And um, uh, Councillor Park, of course, mentioned the numerous exchanges between China, North <coughs> Korea, and Russia on important events that demonstrated very close relations. How does this affect prospects for North Korea's denuclearization or curbing provocations? Um, can we think of this as emboldening North Korea, or is there a scenario where North Korea might be worried of becoming a bargaining chip at the higher level of talks between these great powers? Really interesting questions. Um, first of all, let me say thank you to the organizers for um, inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. It's a real privilege and an honor to have a chance to share views on this topic, and I apologize for my rather croaky voice. I'm afraid I've um, contracted something, so hopefully it'll last through the course of our discussion. Um, um, let me preface my remarks. I thought I'd focus in this part of the discussion on the question of China and Russia. Um, let me begin with a, a, an accreditation to a group of scholars, the Next Generation Fellows, who the Career Foundation generously supports as part of our Chatham House Career Initiative. Some of them recently explored this issue, and I thought I would draw on some of their findings in giving you a sense of, of where the, the question of North Korea's relations with China and Russia stand. Um, as a framing issue and as a diplomatic historian, I think it's probably worth reminding ourselves of, if you look at the past history of relations between DPRK and, and China and Russia during the Cold War, how much of um, Pyongyang's approach was based on a desire to maintain its independence while at the same time um, taking advantage of the dif different uh, and sometimes convergent interests of both Moscow and Beijing when it comes to the Korean Peninsula. If one goes back to the early stages of the Korean War, we know from new archival evidence the way in which Kim Il-sung, for example, sought to manage the relationship with both Stalin and Mao to ad advance North Korea's own political and strategic interests. And that frame of reference, I would argue, is still important in thinking about the relationship today. Independence, uh, and particularly when it comes to North Korea's military capabilities, has been a long sought goal on the part of the DPRK, as Jonathan Pollock has written about extensively in looking at the development of North Korea's nuclear program. Um, that being said, when we look at the relationship today, um, a number of seasoned observers, Joel Witt, for example, who was very active during the Clinton administration in negotiations with North Korea, has described the relationship at least between North Korea and China as the closest it's ever been. Um, so does that amount to the emergence of a kind of new 
axis of authoritarian states in Northeast Asia. Well, I think I, I share Councillor Park's observations that that would be an exaggeration. Um, but looking at it from the perspective of the DPRK, you can see why there are multiple reasons um, why we might want to assume that there is a desire to strengthen ties. And the circumstantial evidence certainly bears out um, the idea that there's a closer coordination. We saw in July of this year a statement uh, published in Norong Shimbun explicitly emphasizing the importance of boosting ties between China and North Korea. And as we've heard from some of the other presentations on this panel, um, if you take um, a charitable interpretation of the North Korean position, um, we could explain that in terms of the strategic challenges and threats that North Korea itself um, faces. And it's certainly something that the North Korean public position seeks to emphasize, criticizing the vigilant storm joint exercises between the US and South Korea, highlighting the fact that the rhetoric from South Korea under President Yoon with the rearticulation of the kill chain strategy is seen as a hostile gesture from the South. Um, when it comes to relations between the DPRK and Russia, there have been a series of developments this year. In July, Foreign Minister Chae Son Hui um, articulated North Korea's support for the so-called independent Russian republics in the Ukraine, um, one of only three countries to make such a statement. In October, North Korea voted with Russia to reject the General Assembly's resolution criticizing the annexation of Ukraine, of parts of Ukraine. Uh, and US intelligence has been reporting recently uh, that North Korea has been involved in providing artillery <coughs> supplies to the Russian government to support the war in Ukraine. Um, in return for that, of course, we've seen a, a number of developments in recent years that have um, benefited uh, the, the North Korean regime. In 2014, Russia canceled 90% of Soviet-era debt between Russia uh, and North Korea. In 2019, Kim was rewarded with a symbolic, important bilateral meeting um, with Putin in Vladivostok. Um, and that sort of idea that there are benefits to be gained both in terms of status, but materially, helps, I think, to understand why the, the North Korean government would be wanting to move closer to its uh, traditional Cold War partners. Same is true with relations with China. Uh, we've seen, again, forceful declaratory policy from Pyongyang, um, objecting to any interference on the issue of Taiwan, um, a statement it made in August. Um, North Korea has come out publicly and supported the Chinese crackdown on um, the democracy movement in Hong Kong. In 2019, we again, we saw a visit by um, Kim to, uh, by Xi Jinping to Pyongyang. Uh, again, hugely symbolically important in stressing the importance of the bilateral relationship. And in 2021, um, the reaffirmation of the 1961 Treaty of Friendship, Cooperation, and Mutual Assistance between Beijing and Pyongyang. Um, so what's the payoff from all of this from the point of view of the DPRK? Um, as was mentioned in the last panel, um, both China and Russia, of course, have rejected UN sanctions um, against the DPRK in the wake of all of these provocative missile launches. Um, supplies of coal from North Korea to China have continued to flow uh, with the support, it seems, of the government in Beijing. Uh, and as again, as Councillor Park mentioned, we've seen a flurry of formal correspondence, letters, uh, including perhaps most strikingly of all on October 13th, a letter by Xi Jinping to the North Korean leadership talking about the importance of increasing bilateral strategic communication and cooperation, whatever that might mean in concrete terms. Um, and again, as the last panelist was mentioning, um, it may be the case that the North Korean regime takes from the lesson of Putin's saber rattling, um, that there is space and opportunity to use declaratory policy to assert its strategic and political interests on the Korean Peninsula. And we've certainly seen that in terms of the declarations from North Korea about its willingness to contemplate um, the preemptive use of nuclear weapons against South Korea. Um, all of that helps perhaps get us inside the mind of the North Koreans, but how is that seen from the vantage point of both China uh, and Russia? Well, again, I think it's, it's worth drawing on some of the recent statements um, just yesterday um, President Biden said, quote, I'm confident that China is not looking to engage in more escalat escalatory actions when it comes to North Korea and the Korean Peninsula. Um, so at least 
in terms of America's public statements, there is an assumption that the Chinese want to avoid a further intensification of the strategic situation on the peninsula. For all of the reasons that I think have often been rehearsed in the past, um, China wants to avoid uh, an actual conflict and the physical proximity of North Korea to China and the possibility of what would happen in the event of a crisis, I think makes that fairly clear cut. Um, the United States also, and this was part of President Biden's statement um, this week, has made it clear that in the face of the North Korean challenge, it will increase its Indo-Pacific defense capacity, not in an effort to challenge China, um, but to deal with the challenge of North Korea. And as Biden said, I think very tellingly, the United States will be up in the face of China, highlighting, I think, this need on the part of the Chinese leadership to recognize that so long as the North Korean challenge continues, the logic of American deployment in the Indo-Pacific becomes all the more powerful, and that's, again, something that Beijing would want to avoid. Um, but it's unclear whether this is going to be sufficient of an incentive to persuade China to act in a way that restrains North Korea, and it leaves open the question of whether China has the capability to deliver an outcome from the North Koreans, given Pyongyang's fierce independence to moderate its position when it comes to testing, including most obviously on the question of a seventh nuclear test. Um, as for the view from Russia, I have no insight into the thinking of President Putin. But again, if you think historically in terms of past precedent, all the way back to the Korean War, it was, um, it was Stalin's observation at the time of then the then North Korean leader Kim Il-sung that an attack on South Korea, not something that I think is about to happen, I should hasten to add, but any sense of tension in the region that distracts the United States from Europe, as was the case back in the 1940s, would be something that the Russian leadership would, would welcome. And the same logic arguably would apply today. Um, just finally, to come back to the question of how best to deal with this, this closer coordination between the three states in the region, China, Russia, and North Korea, is the United States doing enough? Well, Joel Witt has said very publicly, it isn't. Um, he's made it clear that despite America's commitment to meet with the North Korean leadership with no preconditions, this is not going to be sufficient to persuade North Korea to come back to the negotiating table. Witt goes further and says the audacious initiative is also insufficient to persuade North Korea to change its position um, when it comes to negotiations. Um, some have argued that at least until the midterm elections, the United States, the Biden administration, was not really prioritizing the North Korean issue, partly because of concerns to deal with the war in Ukraine, but also the lack of a real appetite in Washington to prioritize the North Korean issues. Will the midterms have changed that? Will it give President Biden more breathing space to give more explicit attention to the issue of North Korea? I'm not sure. Um, but I think we can take comfort from the fact that we have seen, that really from the very beginning of this administration, a steady emphasis on the importance of alliance coordination. Um, and of course, President Yoon in South Korea has been very vocal in reciprocating and reinforcing that commitment. Um, and from that, I, I would say we should take a great deal of comfort. Um, I can talk about that perhaps a little bit later when we look at the wider question of the US and its allies in the region. But mm -hmm. those are my initial observations on the question of China and Russia. OK, okay thank you. Um, I'd now like to ask a briefer second round of questions uh, for our panelists so we can dig a little deeper into what was already discussed. Um, so going back to Mr. Dempsey, you've uh, told us how North Korea has been trying very hard to enhance its missile capabilities. So I guess the next question is, does their development in recent years pose a significant challenge to the kind of defense that we have in the region? Thank you. In short, yes, <laughs> but I'll expand on that a little bit more. So I think what we really consider is the, what we've seen, particularly since 2019, when North Korea resumed um, testing um, missiles. And the, so certainly in 2017, there's a, there a lot of testing, a lot of building up of um, emergent capabilities, particularly emphasizing on the, the longer range stuff, so successful launches of IRBM systems and ICBM systems in that year. They stopped for two years in terms of um, testing at least, not development, but testing. And when they re-emerged in 2019, there was renewed efforts focused on much shorter range systems, typically those under um, uh, 1,000 kilometers, so one, ones relevant to the region, both uh, Republic of Korea and, to a degree, Japan. And what we've seen is really WASCUDs and SCUD-based derivatives, uh, so legacy Soviet systems and, and their own derivatives of those, 
still form the backbone of their short missile forces, probably. What we've seen is a new generation of more accurate and capable systems emerge. And that really represents a big evolution and diversification um, of the threat, and also the challenge of existing uh, missile defenses um, in the region. Certainly a challenge that wasn't necessarily anticipated when these systems were invested in, I'd say. Now, of course, that's not to say they're not evolving, and it's not saying they're not capable, but we'll get onto that a little bit more. So what are we talking about in terms of the evolution of these horses? So just to break them down a little bit and some of the different capabilities we've seen emerge. So we've seen systems like the KN-23 and the KN-24, which mimic a little bit the Russian Iskander and the, um, some of the uh, Robert Gavir Hyundai series. These are the best trajectory short-range missile systems, so they don't necessarily fly, fly high up on a parabolic trajectory. Um, as a consequence, there's less warning when they come over the horizon, potentially. Um, they also, again, I'm not a technical expert missile defense here, but there was concern that they may exploit a, kind of the range of um, the apogee, the, the altitude. They may exploit um, kind of a weakness, shall we say, between existence like Patriot and FAD. They also demonstrate an irregular trajectory, meaning they can change the trajectory mid-course. Um, so it's not a traditional parabolic curve, uh, so-called pull-up maneuvers, so they can actually go like that to some degree. Um, that means they're difficult to potentially intercept, but also it makes it hard to work out what target they're intending to hit. Um, we've also seen some development towards, um, certainly in the last 12 months, um, what is commonly called HGVs or hypersonic movable vehicles. Now, when we talk about hypersonics, there's a lot of misunderstanding of language there, but what we are talking about, or in, in a meaningful term, is um, hypersonic maneuverable warheads, essentially. Most missiles, most missiles we talk about in new generation are hypersonic, they go over Mach 5, but it's the maneuverability of the warhead, uh, often a separate stage, or often a separate terminal stage, that is the problem. Now, exactly where North Korea, it's only conducted three tests, first type in um, last year, and then two seemingly more successful tests earlier this year in January. Now, while we're not talking, suggesting that maneuverability is anything to do with evasive maneuvers around missile defenses, it does have the ability to change flight path, possibly, um, which makes it hard to work out what the intended target is and prioritize that. It also potentially, in its extreme form, may allow it to um, go round missile defenses, exploiting weaknesses in the um, coverage. We've also seen MRLSs as well, which um, again emerged since 2019, particularly the, the, the high caliber system, the 600 millimeter system, which also kind of um, exploit the depressed trajectory advantages. And as well, their launch numbers, we can be talking about anywhere between four and six per vehicle as well. So there's a potential of a lot of missiles coming your way from one single vehicle. Um, we've also seen, more recently in the last year, cruise missiles, something that we've suspected North Korea has wanted to develop for some time. So obviously they have, um, I should point out, anti-ship cruise missiles, but we're talking about land attack cruise missiles now. We've only seen that in the last year. Um, two types of missile, one notionally strategic, so nuclear armed, claim, uh, and one that potentially um, just conventional. The advantage of those cruise missiles, and that's something I've wrote, written about fairly recently as well, is they um, have the ability to kind of go around the targets as well, so you don't necessarily know what the aim, what the intended goal is, they also operate at lower altitude, and they can circumvent you know, security paths uh, around existing missiles, so they potentially can go down the coast and come back in if they wanted to. And again, the claimed range of these systems is anywhere up to 2,000 kilometers, which I think it seems a bit extreme, because I'm not entirely sure what the testing parameters of those are, but it does show that they're developing that capability. So much more diverse engagement environment and much more diverse threat. Now, South Korea will periodically put out reassurances when there's a new test of a new system, um, saying that they have the ability to counter that system. And I think some of that um, reassurance is put out because there is a difficulty in tracking some of these new systems. So we get multiple different estimates about what that system did in tests but, uh, from um, the Republic of Korea, Japan, and of course uh, from North Korea itself. There is a slight difference between tracking a system, so, uh, tracking a test uh, into the, um, the sea and versus a more representative threat of it coming over the horizon when you have better coverage. So I would take some of the differences and uh, ambiguity with a little bit of pinch of salt there. 
However, despite these, these reassurances, as I said, these systems weren't originally designed with this North Korean threat in mind or this emergent North Korean threat in mind. No system is perfect. Um, and as I said, over the last five years, particularly, the threat has evolved and diversified significantly. And if these were deployed in any kind of coordinated, meaningful way, these systems would represent a significantly more complex environment to counter. So in terms of identifying the missiles and projectiles, in terms of also prioritizing them as well, because it won't always be clear necessarily what the target is. And there is a limited number of air defense rounds loaded in your systems. And there's a quite strong possibility of being overwhelmed by, these system, uh, by the, the incoming projectiles. Um, and it's also worth noting that you know, in any kind of conventional or even nuclear strike, targeting South Korean missile defenses will be a key priority for North Korea. And you know, there will be some, some of these new systems, like particularly KN-23, particularly hypersonics, if they move towards that and actually can deploy a, a good system, um, will be like kind of the golden bullet. They'll take out the key defenses, paving the way for more of a legacy systems, which are uh, more vulnerable to such systems. I think it's also worth noting um, that South Korean air missile and air defenses are part of you know, one part of that free access system to countering North Korea's uh, missiles and abilities. And these new systems that we talked about here actually potentially challenge a second part, which is the kind of the kill chain, the strategy of preemptive strike particularly um, that a lot of them are solid-fueled as opposed to the kind of legacy scuds, which are liquid fueled, And these have a lot less time to prepare. There's less visible indications that they are preparing for launch. They don't need to be pre-fueled. Uh, sorry, they, they come pre-fueled, unlike uh, scuds. So, you know, in some cases, it could be as low as five, 10 minutes on a for high readiness for a road mobile system to um, actually fire off a missile. We've also seen a diversification of deployment methods, which also make a challenge for preemptive strike because it's hard to work out where these systems are and their preparation. So while historically, certainly, uh, North Korea's always em emphasis on mobility, all its um, ground-based forces are road mobile, we've also seen diversification to look towards a rail launch systems of SRB uh, SRBMs. We've also seen the development, particularly over the last, since 2014, of an SRBM program, which is diverse in its own sense, and there may be some new existing challenges there, but they've also potentially moved that inland to look at reservoirs and lakes. Um, and potentially even looking at an air-launched cruise missile capability as well, although that's only indicated it hasn't been shown as such. Now, all these things certainly make for a more complicated environment to engage and counter these systems. Um, and while I'm not saying they can't be countered, and um, as well as, you know, South Korea is obviously investing very much on its domestic systems as well to counter these, um, and will do so. It also makes for diversification and spreading of their own resources to counter all the potential threats that are emerging from North Korea. Yeah, thank you. Um, and now to Dr. Leveringhaus. Um, it's been mentioned a numer numerous times that uh, North Korea might be conducting its seventh nuclear test. Um, so my question is, why and what is the motivation and what is North Korea hoping to achieve by conducting a seventh nuclear test? Yeah, it's a good question. It follows on very well yeah. from the first mm -hmm. because, as Joseph has sort of indicated very clearly, um, North Korea still has a long road to travel down technically, right? So there's an incredibly strong technical reason um, for a seventh test. Um, North Korea's nuclear weapons program is not complete, right? Put very simply. There are other motivations, of course. Uh, there's domestic political motivation, in particular to demonstrate a resolute focus on the program, particularly coming out of you know, the pandemic and so forth. But I think the technical reasons are very clear. And I think um, you know, Joseph has already outlined a number of, of, of issues. Uh, one uh, issue is um, very clear since the 2017 test. So that was the sixth test that, that North Korea conducted. And it's kind of the only one that matters out of the six because the previous tests that took place um, were not that significant technically. Um, the sixth test, the yield, for instance, of that test was, was very big. One of those tests, <coughs> thermonucleus, over 100 kilotons. That's very significant, whereas previous ones were very small, for instance. Um, 
And, you know, there is a sense that potentially North Korea, you know, is obviously wanting to build on that, on that capability that, that was demonstrated in 20, 2017. And in 2017, one of the things that the test demonstrated that obviously North Korea could, um, uh, could successfully develop a, a device that had a very big yield, but it, it also demonstrated it did not yet have the capacity, for instance, um, to deliver it uh, at long ranges successfully. So intelligence services realized, for instance, that there's a, there's a, there's a stage or a part of, of, of a nuclear weapon uh, being used, which is called a re-entry, whether you've got a small single warhead or a warhead with many different parts, a multiple warhead, and that didn't work for North Korea in 2017. So the re-entry phase is important because basically it's about making that that weapon survive re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. It's very hot and, and so forth, right? And that didn't work for the North Koreans at that point in time, so that's clearly something that they're going to work on for their, their long-range intercontinental ballistic missile capability, uh, something they might want to demonstrate in the, in, the sixth, in the seventh test. And as Joseph said, these things are not necessarily easy, right? They're technically, technically hard. Um, and North Korea has been actually quite open. You know, in 2021, it, it sort of it told the world what its shopping list was, <laughs> right? In terms of things it wanted to improve on, technically, um, you know, including improving accuracy and precision of its missiles, particularly <clears throat> later stages of the guidance of those. Joseph mentions hypersonic, you know, the submarine launch ballistic missile capabilities, which are really in their infancy. They're really very sort of nascent level. Um, and of course, North Korea is not the only country to be doing that, right? China is developing these capabilities, Pakistan, India, they're all developing particularly submarine launch ballistic missile capabilities that are actually, relatively speaking, in their, in their, in their infancy. So I think there is a very strong technical um, aspect to this. Um, to give you some sort of sense of the picture, as I say, the, 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 the last test is the one that I think is technically significant, so they all want to build on that. Um, it, it's potentially possible that they will restart certain reactors in terms of the weapons-grade material that exists. Some people estimate it, North Korea has enough for maybe 50, 60 nuclear weapons, um, and potentially the ability for you know, developing a slightly smaller number, half that number in terms of, of warheads. So there's a number of things, technically speaking, that clearly motivate um, uh, North Korea. And of course, there's the broader regional context, right? And, and what I mentioned earlier about South Korea, Joseph mentioned the kill chain, but you know, I mentioned the decapitation strategy that South Korea has been talking about. And if we just sort of draw it back to its very basics, nuclear strategy, a credible nuclear strategy, really relies on three things. It relies on what we call the three Cs, the classic three Cs. You know, a capability, of course, that needs to be demonstrated. Clear communication, so I talked to that um, earlier when I said about <coughs> who presses the button. Uh, and credibility, right? I mean, if you can't have those things in place, um, and I think very much the test is about sort of trying to um, improve those, those three Cs, particularly in the face of what it sees as imp improvements in South Korea's capabilities to mm -hmm. deter North Korea. Lastly, I would say, what happens on the South Korean US front in terms of what they talk about with each other? So it's not simply about improving the alliance. For a very long time, South Korea and the US have not always been on the same page, haven't always been aligned in their deterrence approaches towards North Korea. Will that change? I'm not sure. Certainly at the moment, they're talking to each other, which is a good thing, and, and there is a great need for that. Uh, they need to be on the same page. But North Korea is, is communicating to both the United States and South Korea with a seventh test um, that unless they get their act together, that, that basically it would be easier to deter both of them um, um, as it continues to improve its, its capabilities. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. I think that li links very well to the next question for Dr. Nielsen Wright. Um, so if we bring all these threads together, you know, we have these missile launches, nuclear doctrine, nuclear potential seventh test. Um, they have really raised the stakes for regional, regional and global insecurity as security. So how should we, um, how should allies cope with these increasingly sophisticated provocations? 
Yeah, it's a really um, essential question, and it's a, it, it all depends, really. Um, you know, one thing we haven't talked a great deal about is the politics, the domestic politics, and how it affects some of these decisions. Um, and I suppose we can look at it from the vantage point of some of the individual countries, and we can look at some of the efforts to try and promote greater mini or multilateral coordination. I'll say a few things, if I may, first about South Korea, then Japan, um, before moving on to the United States, and then looking at the bigger picture in terms of um, regional cooperation. In the case of South Korea, um, you know, we have a, a president who's relatively untested in foreign <coughs> affairs, um, who comes from a tradition as a former special prosecutor, um, who's very focused on domestic issues. There's a real question really, really about capacity and how much time can be devoted to these critical essential security issues. He's got a good team around him, people who are very international, the foreign minister, Park Jin, Kim Sung Han, his national security advisor. These are people who have well-established links with the United States. So to come back to the previous point, you know, how close is the relationship with the United States? There are people in place who I think reflect those important personal ties. But of course, President Yoon is suffering a very sharp decline in his popularity at home. And how does that affect his ability to really um, focus on the North Korean issue? The good news is that in terms of um, signaling to the DPRK, extended deterrence has been systematically and consistently re-emphasized. The joint exercises could be seen, despite the North's efforts to present them as a provocation, a further confirmation that the two Militaries are working closely together. You mentioned the dispatch of the Ronald Reagan. And again, there are lots of examples of this. And in the face of the recent um, uncertainties around the Northern Limit Line, uh, I'm not a military strategist, but it seems to me superficially that the response from uh, South Korea has been clear and proportionate. Um, but there is a lot of worry about the, given the number of provocations, at the danger of escalation. Um, and of course, one of the biggest problems for South Korea in terms of dealing with this security challenge is that it doesn't have a great deal of agency because North Korea is not picking up the phone. North Korea is not responding positively to any overtures that are coming from South Korea. Um, and then that brings into the question the, the issue of public opinion. Much is made of the fact that when you look at opinion polls, there seems to be an increasing number of South Koreans who support the idea of having some sort of independent tactical nuclear weapons. President Yoon has been very clear in saying that is not part of South Korea's position. The United States has reinforced that. Um, but there is a debate going on in South Korea, and I don't think we can ignore that. Um, some retired US generals, such as Curtis Scaparotti, have talked about some sort of NATO-style nuclear planning group. I'd be interested to know if Sophie has any insights on that, whether what that would look like in the context of South Korea. Um, for the other country that, of course, is most preoccupied with the threat of North Korea, Japan, the, re the launch on October 4th of a North Korean missile that flew over uh, Japanese airspace and landed in the Pacific, much as in 1998 when the Tepodong missile was launched, has reinforced a sense of acute anxiety and vulnerability in Japan. Um, and that has fueled um, a big gradual but nonetheless significant shift in Japan's defense posture. Um, Japan is in the midst this year of reassessing three of its key national security policies. Um, Prime Minister Kishida has made it fairly clear that the government is moving away from what has been a long-standing norm, this idea of senshu boy, defensive defense, to a position that looks at the idea of developing some sort of a counterforce capability, the acquisition of cruise missiles, the desire on the part of Japan to purchase Tomahawk missiles from the United States. Again, I'm not sure, Joseph, you may have a better sense of this, to what extent the United States has signed off on this. There's talk of re-equipping Aegis destroyers to have Tomahawk missiles. Um, all of this taking place in a context where Japan is committed to an increase in its defense spending um, to the 2% NATO target. Part of that involves a little bit of accounting Legitimate. It's, a, it's an attempt, if you like, to sort of boost the figures, but there is also a substantive commitment by the government, I think, to increase its defense preparedness. And here, too, public opinion is important. Kishida has been criticized, particularly by progressive opinion in Japan, for a lack of transparency, of trying to push this debate forward too quickly by the end of the year. 
Um, and Prime Minister Kishida, of course, much like President Yoon, is remarkably weak at home. Uh, the latest public opinion polls give him 37% support, which is a dramatically low level for a Japanese Premier just barely one year into his term of office. Uh, the key coalition partner of the LDP, Kormeiko, um, historically is very opposed to this sort of more assertive security posture, and that is having an impact on the government's ability to deliver on some of these policy initiatives. The other dimension, of course, where Japan is concerned uh, when it comes to North Korea is the broader issue of disarmament. And of course, Prime Minister Kishida, who hails from Hiroshima, of course, the city which um, we need, has a particular sensitivity to the nuclear issue, means that on some areas, for example, support for the NPT regime, Prime Minister Kishida has been very outspoken. Next year, the G20, G7 summit will take place in Hiroshima. This is really important for Japan's opportunity to highlight the importance of coordination in, in um, making progress on disarmament. Um, but that's not the only area where, of course, Japan is trying to address the security challenge of North Korea and, of course, the wider security challenge of China. Um, and we see that in Japan's support for the Quad, its, its support for AUKUS. Um, very importantly, I think, again, in terms of practical coordination, is the idea of developing new quasi-alliances. We've seen um, a significant reaffirmation and redevelopment of the relationship with Australia. Uh, the last time that happened was back in 2007, um, a reciprocal access agreement that will allow Australian and Japanese forces to train together. Uh, recently, President Steinmeier from Germany was in Japan, and the similar sort of ambition for a quasi-alliance and using the familiar two plus two format to strengthen bilateral coordination. And even with the United Kingdom, of course, a long history of uh, close coordination, particularly in defense technology. Um, where will this all lead? Um, again, I suppose to come back to the question of the United States, I agree with the last presentation that you know, we shouldn't assume that from the vantage point of Seoul and Tokyo, there is a confident assumption that the United States is fully committed to staying the course in the long term. And for that, we have Donald Trump to thank. Um, you know, a much more transactional president who, of course, talked very openly about the possibility of pulling South Korean forces off the peninsula, questioning even the commitment of the United States to NATO. Are the midterms? A positive indication that we've moved out of that danger zone would a future president DeSantis or Pence or Yonkin um, mark a return to normality in terms of alliance policy? I hope so, but if you were a cautious and sensitive and uh, risk-averse national security planner, you might want to make the assumption that it wouldn't necessarily deliver that sort of reassurance, um, which is one reason why I think we've seen so much concerted efforts by the likes of Blinken, Austin, Jake Sullivan, and Wendy Sherman to try and emphasize the importance of reassurance. Um, and of course, there have been lots of areas where we've seen much closer coordination between Japan and the United States. Um, the missing part of this puzzle, perhaps, um, is closer trilateral coordination. To come back to the theme that we talked about earlier, um, the extent to which China, North Korea, and Russia are responding to the perceived closer coordination between Seoul, Tokyo, and Washington. Um, there has been a lot of progress, joint operations, um, but part of the problem is that when it comes to bilateral ties between Seoul and Tokyo, the legacy of history and emotional politics remains just as salient. And perhaps it's, you know, when we talk about historic precedents, a lot of us, I think, looking at the bilateral relationship have, have been depressed at the difficulty of re-energizing cooperation between the two countries such as the vulnerability of leaders in both countries to public opinion um, that is hostile to either Japan and South Korea or, or, or towards South Korea and Japan. Um, part of this has involved trying to simply get the leaders together. And of course, on the back of the summits we've just seen in, um, in Cambodia and now in Bali, the, the good news is that the leaders are meeting. Um, even if they disagree about how to label these meetings, whether they're meetings or simple casual chats, um, there is, I think, a recognition that these historical issues, questions of victimization, a lack of agency on the part of um, uh, each of the states when it comes to resolving these historical issues should not be underestimated. Um, which leads me to the last point, which is what can other states do and other actors in thinking about coordination? 
Um, as the first panel, I think, rightly pointed out, it's important to keep CVID on the table, to keep emphasizing the importance of not resiling from that position. European countries, of course, in addition to the European Union, have had, when we think about longer term solutions to the security challenge, have played often a very important um, dialogue role. When we think of countries like Sweden through Track 1.5 diplomacy, uh, the role of the United Kingdom with a long history of diplomatic ties. Um, to what extent are there opportunities to use those diplomatic ties and the Track 1.5 process to reach out to the DPRK away from the glare of publicity is an open question. Um, it is alarming, of course, to come back to domestic politics to see the extent to which populist political campaigns in countries like Sweden and Italy, two countries which, of course, have long histories of relations with the DPRK, may be compromising or limiting the opportunity for those states to revisit that traditional role, um, which again brings us back to the question of um, actors like the European Union and NATO in using declaratory policy as a way of keeping the broader picture um, front and center, not just in terms of security provisions, but thinking about diplomacy. OK, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we now have about um, 10, 15 minutes for questions from the audience. Um, so let's take maybe two or three questions at a time, and then we have responses and see how many rounds we can do. Please first identify yourself before asking your questions. Yes, one. Hello. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, hello, and my question, by, uh, my question will be, uh, as you talked about the need of testing the new weapons uh, systems, uh, is it possible to think that the usage of North Korean uh, weapons in, war, in the war in Ukraine uh, is a way of testing the new uh, military technologies for North Korea without taking much attention from the diplomatic field? Okay, uh, do we have another question? Uh, yes. Um, hi, I'm Lynn from uh, International Relations Bachelor. I have a question in regards to the relationship of the elite um, politic politicians within those countries. As we've seen, the relationship between Xi Jinping and Putin is very important in regards to their relationship and how it translates to foreign affairs. Do you think that such a relationship between um, Xi Jinping and Kim Jong-un is as important as it is between Putin and Xi Jinping, or is it less of a centerpiece of their foreign relations? Okay. Thank you. Uh, so we have a question about testing weapons, whether Ukraine can be used as an example, and a question about the, uh, the role or importance of elite relations. Would anyone like to, I think? Should I take the, yeah. the weapons one, I guess? Um, so first, it's important to note that um, North Korea has denied on two occasions that it has anything to do with supplying Russian, uh, Russia with any weapons for Ukraine. Of course, the US has said otherwise. Um, I think it's important to note that um, the systems that we have been identified, or the types of systems we've identified, are all legacy systems. So there are, are rockets rather than missiles, so generally unguided uh, rockets and um, artillery shells. And the reason, one of the reasons why they come into North Korea is logically that in terms of the, the Soviet era stuff, uh, in terms of ammunition stocks, beyond Russia, um, North Korea probably represents this, the biggest stockpile of those that are compatible with Russian legacy systems. There's no suggestion that any of the newer systems are included in this. And if I was certainly Russia, I would be hesitant with going for newer systems first uh, because you'd have to integrate and train them. Uh, obviously, um, Russia is looking at newer systems, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Iran for certain capabilities, however, but there's no suggestion that anything beyond um, old legacy artillery and um, unguided rockets was ever been discussed with North Korea. Uh, anyone for the individual level? I can say something. Yep. Um, on this question of individual relations, um, it's hard to know to what extent there is a kind of common agenda. Um, both in terms of the way Kim Jong-un and Xi Jinping seem to be managing their strategic priorities. Um, at face value, there, there seems to be a, a kind of rational logic to the way in which so much of their foreign policy decision-making 
is played out. And one hopes that when it comes to these efforts to assert their strategic interests and to engage in some sort of brinkmanship, it is informed by a kind of rational calculation. The same can't be said for President Putin. And I think that's obvious from the way in which the war in Ukraine started, proceeded, the, the language that Putin used to describe and legitimize and justify his actions. Um, in all of this, I think what's striking is the extent to which um, nationalism um, and a sense of grievance seems to have been a, a major factor in understanding why Putin was willing to take the risks that he did and why he's still there. Um, and this question of resolve, I mean, we come back to the, the importance of signaling. Um, despite the very welcome progress of um, the Ukrainian forces in Kherson, some expect that there is, going to, there is a, a thinking on the part of the Kremlin that by maintaining their presence, they may wear down Western resolve, they may um, weaken the commitment on the part of some countries to support Ukraine's efforts. Um, that seems misplaced, but again, it's, it may be part of Putin's calculations. By contrast, when it comes to Kim and Xi, there's nothing to suggest at this point that they're willing to engage in the sort of provocative and highly risky strategies that Putin has engaged in. I mean, I'll just add that, I mean, Lynn is one of my students, so she probably knows what I'm going to say. I think it matters hugely, the leadership interactions, right? Um, Putin and, and, and Xi, Xi and Kim Jong-un, I think, as, as you know, and as we've discussed, Putin's understanding of China, his long engagement with China, his many connections with China is incomparable to any other world leader, right? I mean, Putin has this advantage over Biden, over any leader that wants to engage with China, right? And so he, therefore, that's also true for Kim Jong-un. He understands the Chinese system, has engaged with it for a very long time, um, and so he, he understands that system better than Kim Jong-un. Equally, though, it's also true, like John has mentioned, that you know, North Korea has always sought to maintain a level of independence in its relationship with, with China. That's still true. It's only, uh, it's, only, it's only grown. And if you look at the reporting of, for instance, the meetings between Xi Jinping and, and uh, Kim Jong-un, you know, the reportings are slightly different where you look, right? Whether you're looking in North Korea or China, China very much portrays that relationship as one of superiority and being a big brother right, in, that, in, 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 in that relationship. Um, but similarly, China wants to keep things open in the relationship. It wants to, to, and that's a good thing, right? And that's a good thing for the world. Uh, but it is quite stark, as I think, just to draw from what John said earlier, that you do have these very strong leaders, right? Uh, Putin, uh, Xi Jinping especially, you know, uh, amid you know, a series of weaker uh, regional leaders at, at the moment in time, um, and um, if you if you if the you know that the picture the regional political picture um, uh, is is very much in favour I guess of these of these states at the moment in terms of their elite level leadership their longevity and their awareness and engagement uh, with each other on these issues. Okay, thank you. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Yes, first here and then there, please. Hi, I'm Eve. I'm um, an MA international relations student, and this question is, um, I've got a question about kind of the historical like memory, I guess, that's still present in East Asia politics. So um, as we've seen that the new law in South Korea is being more preemptive, like Dr. Levinhans was saying, um, is, that, is that a response to kind of the fading memory of like the Korean War on the North Korean side? Because like that narrative of um, North Korea being like attacked from everywhere, um, that's why they have like this like defensive narrative. Is that because like that memory is fading or is it more um, a response to a more recent kind of development in um, the global stage. Okay, thank you. Um, there was a question at the, the back. Hello, um, thank you so much for the insight book talks. Um, I'm Yu Xuan, I'm a fresher on politics. Um, I have a question regarding the roles of China and Russia and their support um, to North Korea and their impacts on the North Korean nuclear doctrine. So say if um, NATO or the UN failed to take China on board in 
um, helping to denuclearize North Korea. And um, while well, the support from China and in addition from Russia, since uh, North Korea has supported Russia in the Ukraine war, well, the support um, from these two countries actually increased North Korea's nuclear uh, proliferation as they might view uh, the DPRK as a valuable asset to counter the threats from US like post on Ukraine and post on Taiwan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Man, okay. Shall we start with the historical memory question? I, I think that would be directed to Dr. Nielsen, right? Um, well, I hesitate to um, talk about Korean historical memory when there are Koreans in the room who will know much more than I do. Um, and as an outsider, it's not really my role to, um, to pontificate on that issue. But the one thing I would say is, um, you know, we have a generation of politicians um, and leaders uh, who have, you know, intimate connection with the DPRK. Um, former President uh, Moon, of course, his family comes from North Korea. Um, and this is re re very, very recent history um, and the legacy of the war, um, which we see reflected, of course, in popular culture and film, is not something I think that anyone could expect to uh, ignore. And I don't think it would be anything that, yeah. it, simply the passage of time is not going to make South Korea more willing to engage in security policy that would highlight or increase the risk of conflict. Um, this is still raw and visceral. Um, and still being debated as a historical phenomenon. So um, I think uh, the proximity, of course, of North Korea and the, you know, the fact that we see the experience of um, ordinary Koreans, both North and South, played out so often uh, in popular culture uh, means that I think it's, it's impossible for politicians to be anything but serious in contemplating the, the risk of conflict on the peninsula. Thank you. And the, the last question about China and Russia's involvement, um, this is something that... Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't mind taking that. I mean, I think a lot will depend um, how China responds to the next nuclear test, uh, North Korea's seventh nuclear test, whether it's, you know, the similar approach that it's had or whether it's a stronger approach. When North Korea tested in 2017, uh, the Chinese media are quite critical, um, and th this brings in the domestic element of the debate around North Korea within China is actually quite varied and is actually quite critical, um, you know, to the extent that there was a real debate about whether the security arrangements would be reaffirmed that John mentioned. There was a big debate, internal debate in China about that. You know, there are, there's a strong view in China that the relationship with North Korea shouldn't actually be militarily closer. Um, so it, there is actually, there's something to pick at there, I guess, externally. Um, I think also from China's perspective, its relationship with South Korea has really um, gone downhill, particularly since the THAAD incident in 2016, where it applied very harsh economic measures, right? and official san sanctions in effect, really. Uh, and that really had a, a really bad blowback effect on that relationship that China, I don't think, actually expected initially. So there is a balancing act here, right? On the one hand, China wants to keep its relationship with North Korea open, but it wouldn't want to worsen even further its relationship with South Korea, in effect, pushing South Korea more towards the United States and maybe even Japan, however difficult that may be. So it is a balancing act. And I think more broadly, what, what you suggest, what would it require from a strategic perspective is actually quite a, quite a tall call. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's something very difficult to envision that Beijing would be willing to enter into very high level military talks um, 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 you know, and sharing information and intelligence China has officially, and very, for a very long time, been very much against those kind of procedures. You know, it's been very much against, for instance, extensions of security guarantees in the nuclear domain right, for a very long time. It doesn't have that history and practice, right? And that's probably an advantage that the US and others have through the Five Eyes, through other arrangements that China doesn't have that experience of, even in its relationship with Russia. So um, I think the logistics of that are tricky. Um, but I think also the, 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 sort of the politics and the diplomacy around it are even trickier. 
Um, thank you very much. We have now come to the end of our session. Please join me in thanking our speakers. It uh, falls to me again to say thank you. Thank you to our moderators, Tatyan and Semi. Thank you to our panelists. Um, your expertise and your insights really make this forum what it is. Thank you to our friends at the embassy for helping to coordinate. You've been fantastic. And thank you to all of you for your attention and your attendance. You've been superb. Thank you to everyone on YouTube for watching as well. Um, the one benefit of being here is, of course, you get to enjoy our reception. So uh, please do help yourself. Uh, enjoy it, and on your way out, remember to take a bag courtesy of the MC. Thank you again.